and welcome. Wherever you're tuning in from, thank you so much for joining us. You're watching the approach and docking coverage of the AX-1 mission currently in progress. I'm Trisha Bhattacharya, a Cruise Systems Group Lead at Axiom Space, and with me is Andy Tran, a quality engineer here at SpaceX. The AX-1 mission is the first all-private crew to the International Space Station. Our four-person four Axiom crew will experience 10 days in orbit, eight days on board the International Space Station, and they are currently en route to their destination. This webcast is a joint broadcast between NASA, SpaceX, and Axiom Space, and we'll walk you through the events of Dragon approaching and docking with the ISS and carry our coverage through the welcome ceremony that awaits the crew once they are on board the International Space Station. The AX-1 mission started yesterday, April 8th, in the early hour mornings of Florida when the Axiom crew arrived at Kennedy Space Center. From there, the SpaceX team transported the crew to the Falcon support building for pre-launch briefings and then helped the AX-1 astronauts suit up in preparation for heading to the launch vehicle. Upon arriving at the launch pad, the crew ascended the 265-foot fixed service structure, crossed the crew access arm to board the Dragon capsule. After, after performing final checkouts, including suit leak checks and comms checks, the closeout teams departed the pad in preparation for launch. At 8.17 a.m. Pacific time, Dragon lifted off from historic pad 39A, and that is what you're seeing on screen uh, right now. We had a beautiful day yesterday. Uh, shortly afterwards, we had successful stage separation. Our Falcon 9 first stage returned to Earth for a landing on our drone ship, a shortfall of Gravitas, and the Dragon spacecraft successfully separated from the Falcon 9 second stage and deployed its nose cone. Since that time, the Axiom crew has been able to eat some of the food specially prepared for them by Chef Jose Andreas and his team and get some rest in anticipation for the docking event you'll see later on this broadcast. Just a few short hours ago, the crew hosted a live on-orbit event from inside of the Dragon spacecraft. We were able to get an inside look into the Dragon cabin interior, hear the crew's thoughts and their excitement on their launch experience, and get introduced to the zero-g indicator caramel given to Mark from one of his partnered research institutions. Before we take you to the teams at Johnson Space Center who are actively monitoring Endeavor's progress, let's meet the crew of AX-1. The AX-1 mission is commanded by retired NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, a Spanish-American who was born in Madrid, Spain, and has also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts home. Michael is a U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz. He has conducted 10 spacewalks in his career, accumulating 67 hours and 40 minutes in the vacuum of space, both of which are NASA records. In 2021, he was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. The pilot for AX-1 is Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Larry is an entrepreneur and a nonprofit activist investor. He has won aerobatic flying competitions and summited both Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier. Through AX-1, he will become the first private pilot to reach the International Space Station. He will also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and enter the bounds of outer space within one year. Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. This mission will add a new dimension to several of these studies. Serving as Mission Specialist 1, Aton Stiba is now the second Israeli ever to fly to space. Aton served for more than four decades as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, where he received the Distinguished Aviator Medal, and today he is an impact investor and philanthropist. In collaboration with the Ramon Foundation, the Israel Space Agency, and the Ministry of Innovation, Science, and Technology, as well as the Ministry of Education, Stiba is flying to the ISS under the Rakia banner and the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. During his time on the ISS, Stiba will facilitate scientific experiments, educational outreach, as well as artistic activities. And completing our crew, Mark Pathy is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, as well as the mission specialist number two on this AX-1 mission. Pathy is currently the chief executive officer and chairman of Montreal-based Maverick, a privately owned investing and financial financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. As a strong believer in the importance of philanthropy, Pathy is a member of the boards and executive committees of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, Don LaRue, and the Pathy Family Foundation. Through the AX-1 mission, Pathy has become Canada's second private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go to space. 
yesterday. We had a beautiful launch. It was really picture perfect conditions, blue skies, fluffy white clouds, and just, you know, we couldn't really ask for anything better. Um, the crew had an exciting launch time, and now they're on their journey to the ISS. So with that, let's head over to NASA's Dan Hewitt, who's joining us from JSC's mission control room for a closer look at Dragon's flight to the International Space Station. Dan? Hey, thanks, Trish, and great to see you and Andy this morning, and welcome, everybody, as we get ready to go through the final phases of the approach and docking for the AX-1 mission. Uh, it's been about 18 hours and change so far since they lifted off. They've executed a series of burns to get them where they are, and we're just now getting into those final parts. And so as you just heard, uh, the crew on board AX-1 right now is getting into their suits. Uh, everybody is uh, in their suits. And sounds like they're in their suits. So they're going to wear those throughout uh, all the different dynamic phases. Obviously, right here during the docking, they also wore them during launch, and then they'll wear them uh, towards the end of the mission with undocking and then that entry, descent, and landing. But I want to go through some of the burns that we've done so far to get us to where we are right now. And everything started after we got on orbit, uh, and we were able to start start executing a series of five different burns to get us up here, the first of which being the phase burn. So that just started the initial raising of Dragon's orbit and positioning it for its actual approach up to the International Space Station. And then about 12 hours after that, the boost burn took place. Now the boost burn is raising Dragon's uh, orbital apogee, or the highest point of its orbit. And it raised it all the way up until it was just about 10 kilometers below the International Space Station, not putting it directly below, but just in altitude about 10 kilometers below. And throughout all these burns, we're using the Draco thrusters on board Dragon. There's 16 of these. There's 12 around the service section and four on what's known as the forward bulkhead. Those are the ones uh, that are essentially pointing straight out through the top hatch and are used for all of these major, we call them delta velocity burns, uh, the ones that are really pushing the vehicle and doing or altitude changes. So we did that boost burn, and that put it about 10 kilometers lower than the station, and then just after that, we did what's known as the close co-elliptic burn. So that puts you on, that put us on our first co-elliptic orbit with the space station. That's just where you're maintaining uh, a pretty circular orbit around planet Earth and then maintaining just about 10 kilometers in altitude below the space station. After that was done, we were able to get to the transfer burn. That again, just raised the orbit one more time, bringing us even closer to the station. We're still several kilometers behind, anywhere from uh, 20 to 80 kilometers. Uh, but then you move up and you're just two and a half kilometers beneath the station. And again, you're co-elliptic um, after that. And so we did that final co-elliptic burn that was done a little bit earlier this morning and put us on that steady path about two and a half kilometers below station. Now, right now we're coming up on what's known as approach initiation, coming up in just about three and a half minutes. This is going to be a fairly long burn, again, using those uh, thrusters on the forward bulkhead and then the ones around the service section to fine tune the attitude as we get up. Uh, to begin our final approach. And before we got to this burn, the teams have gone through a number of steps just to ensure uh, everything operating as we expect on board Dragon, on board Station. Uh, we do a number of different setups on board the space station to get ready for Dragon's arrival and docking, uh, doing things like feathering the solar arrays, essentially uh, adjusting which way they're pointing just to minimize any thruster plumes from Dragon as it gets into its final approach as those can degrade some of the solar cells. So we just want to basically put them in an angle where they're protected during that final approach. We're also handing over the attitude control of the station. Uh, normally we're using uh, the large gyroscopes on the U.S. side uh, for visiting vehicle operations, including Dragon dockings. We hand over control to thrusters over on the Russian segment, just giving us propulsive control as we can fine tune and, and maintain a really steady attitude on station during this approach. So that approach initiation burn, which is coming up in just a little over two minutes, the, the go no goes have gone through the teams, uh, both here in Houston on behalf of the entire International Space Station partnership 
and that go no go also works in the flight control team out at Hawthorne and so after we get through approach initiation we're going to swing directly beneath the International Space Station. Uh, we'll get some additional camera views coming up but our extremely talented Kronos flight controller here in Houston has had views of Dragon throughout uh, and in fact we're getting a pretty spectacular one we should be able to bring it up soon uh, of Dragon just as we're entering in uh, to an orbital sunset. So we're going to do this approach initiation burn, and there you go. Our first look at Dragon, and it will come back. Uh, but So we're about to do this approach initiation burn coming up in about 1 minute 20 seconds, and this is going to swing us up directly beneath the International Space Station. We're going to be about 400 meters right below it. Uh, and this will bring us to what's Endeavor, known as uh, Dragon to ground. Uh, we are in 4.010, and uh, we have successfully completed 5.1 under com checks. Dragon SpaceX, copy all. Moving into section 6. Moving into section Getting six. our first six. views inside the capsule. And for awareness, approach initiation burn in just under 30 seconds. Copy that, Jake. And so we're just 15 seconds away from this approach initiation burn. As you can see, the AX-1 crew suited up and in their seats. And you're hearing the Commander Mike L.A. speak with the core down in Hawthorne, the crew operations and resources engineer, essentially the Capcom over there in on the West Coast. And we have confirmation the AI burn, the approach initiation burn has begun. And so right now, with that approach burn started, we're a little over seven and a half kilometers away from the station still, but we're going to start closing in even quicker now. And this is going to bring us up and underneath, uh, essentially on a center line from the station pointed down to planet Earth. And we're going to be just about 400 meters below. With this approach initiation burn, we're also going to move Dragon inside of what's known as the approach ellipsoid. And that's a, an imaginary shape around the station. Uh, it's a three-dimensional oval about four kilometers wide, two kilometers tall, two kilometers thick, and just governs uh, a lot of the visiting vehicle traffic around station. And so before any vehicles are allowed to move inside that approach ellipsoid, you obviously have to get the go from the station team. Uh, prior to being in that approach ellipsoid, which you can see uh, kind of the imaginary shapes drawn around the station here in the top left corner. The approach ellipsoid is that larger one. Uh, we're going to move inside that. Before we move inside that, vehicles are on what's known as a 24-hour free safe trajectory, essentially meaning if we were to lose complete control. Dot zero, one zero is complete, and we feel great. Copy all, Larry. Great to hear. All right, so good words there from our core up to the crew. The approach initiation burn was nominal, so burn went as it expected. And Dragon now on the right course Dragon, SpaceX uh, to get in closer Dragon to the, the space station. At this time, we are go for suit leak checks in procedure 4.011. So copy all. We're good to go in 4.011 suit leak checks. And so at this point, the crew's going to step into suit leak checks. Uh, as you can see, they still have their visors open while they're 
uh, suited up and in their seats. Uh, the standard configuration is they'll have this, the suits themselves not fully sealed, so visors up. Um, they'll typically leave one of the zippers on the suit open as well. And while they're in that suit, the, the, it has a connection directly to the seat. There's a number of umbilicals, essentially connection points, uh, for the suit to plug into the seat. Uh, and that's able to provide them with a number of different things depending on the port, but all of them uh, can provide access to pressurized uh, nitrox, nitrogen, and oxygen. And that can be flown or flowed into the suits once they're fully sealed, zipped up, and visors down to pressurize the suit as uh, these suits are really the, the main line of defense if we were ever in a situation like a cabin depress, a loss of pressurization uh, inside the capsule. The suits can pressurize with that nitrox, provide a pressurized environment for the crew, um, and also all the necessary breathing gas. When they're not fully sealed up and flowing that, they're just flowing conditioned cabin air, so literally just taking the air from the Dragon cabin, cooling it down and flowing it through the suit just to keep them uh, in a comfortable temperature. Uh, the umbilical also provides communications, so they have uh, essentially a communications uh, headset in that helmet, and then they're able to plug into the seat and then use a communication button on the armrest um, for that direct talking uh, either to the ground or at this point uh, with the space station. Um, we, we have what's known as a bi-directional link at this point, and this is stuff that's been set up uh, a little while before Space we came on the air. SpaceX never, we are ready to, to pressurize. Dragon, SpaceX, go for suit pressurization. We're go for suit pressurization. All right, so the AX-1 crew stepping through some suit leak checks now. So again, what they're going to do is they have the visors closed, the suits fully zipped, and they're going to pressurize them using that nitrox and then just run a leak check and ensure that you just have a stable pressure inside the suit. And we'll do these, and if you've been following since pre-launch, we've done these several times already. They'll do them uh, on the ground as they're getting suited up. We did them once they were in Dragon uh, on the launch pad, and we're going to do them again now. And then we'll do them several times at the end of the flight. Just essentially, before you get into the really dynamic phases of an operation, just do one additional check on the suits to make sure that they have good seals, good, good airflow, everything uh, ready to go in case they are required. Uh, you're going to leak checks are going to be kind of a theme throughout the rest of today's operation. We'll be doing a lot of hatch leak checks following that docking to the space station before we get the hatches open. Um, so you're going to hear those a couple of times. But the crew stepping through those leak checks now, uh, we are continuing to close in on the station at this point. We're just past about the six kilometer, uh, just under 6,000 meters away now from the station and closing in. Uh, they're moving relative to the station at a rate of about four and a half meters per second. Now, obviously, both the Dragon and the station are maintaining an orbital velocity. They're traveling in excess of 17,000 miles an hour relative to planet Earth, uh, but the closing rate between them is fairly slow, uh, just about four and a half meters per second. And that's going to continue to drop down as we get to really the final phases as we're stepping through those different waypoints. Uh, and doing that final approach, slowing down usually to uh, well under a meter per second during final approach. But for now, everything continuing to go smoothly. Uh, we're getting some views. We are in nighttime right now, uh, which is why you're just able to see the navigational lights uh, on board Dragon. And we should be getting a sunrise in about 25 minutes, and then we'll have daylight um, for a little over just about an hour. Um, so we should end up having docking in a nighttime, unfortunately, but by that point we'll be close enough in that lights on Dragon and on station should give us some views of the capsule during final approach. So we're just about 38 minutes away from our arrival at that first waypoint. We're gonna step through uh, three different waypoints during this final approach to the station. 
Uh, the first one's going to be Waypoint Zero, and it's located just 400 meters directly below the space station. So we'll be inside that approach ellipsoid, but still outside what's known as the keep out sphere. That's just the final check. Six Endeavor, uh, four good suit mic checks. Copy all, Larry. We see the same. Four good leak checks. Next up, mid-course maneuver in just over 18 minutes. Time for that, Jake. Thanks. All right, so four good suit leak checks reported down to the core. So at this point, they'll be able to open visors back up and uh, no longer running that pressurized nitrox into the suits, uh, just cycling conditioned cabin air through just to maintain a, a nice, comfortable temperature as they go through the final stages of the approach. Uh, you heard we're about 18 minutes away from what's known as the mid-course burn. This is just a correction burn uh, that's done on that approach to waypoint zero. Uh, all of this flight is done autonomously. Dragon has uh, three redundant flight computers that are constantly calculating its positioning relative to the station um, using a couple of different navigational assets and it's constantly adjusting its approach, its timing for these burns, how long these burns last, uh, just constantly recalculating. And it's been doing this since it got on orbit. That's why uh, we'll typically get a, a rough timeline of when we expect these events to happen, uh, but they just adjust in real time by seconds, by minutes, um, just depending on where the vehicle is. Uh, during this approach to station, Dragon's able to use a number of different navigational assets um, on board the spacecraft. One of the, the big milestones we got through a little bit earlier, a little over an hour ago, was known as Rendezvous Complete, um, which just essentially means our far field, our, our far away rendezvous is finished, um, and we're getting into uh, what's known as proximity operations as we start to use uh, the different systems on board Dragon to actively track relative to the station. Um, and it's able to use uh, GPS sensors, their processors uh, and receivers on board the station uh, that are able to communicate with the GPS on board Dragon as it has several redundant sensors around the outside. Using that relative GPS, Dragon also has um, what's known as the Dragon Eye that's going to get used during uh, the final stages of the approach and the, and the flight in. Again, all this done autonomously, but that Dragon Eye using uh, a laser range finder um, just to essentially bounce lasers uh, off retro reflectors on board the station uh, to give itself uh, updated timings or updated distances, closing rates, things like that during that approach. Uh, Dragon also has star trackers, um, and they are what they sound like using uh, specialized cameras to map its relative position based on uh, the stars it picks up in the night sky. Uh, also using some inertial measurement units, um, which use accelerometers uh, and gyroscopes to essentially do inertial mapping of Dragon's position. And so all of these are working in concert uh, for it to constantly calculate its attitude, its relative position to the space station, where it needs to be for docking, when it needs to do these burns, and just constantly updating itself in real time. So right now, though, we are just under 15 minutes away from that mid-course burn, and then that's going to fine-tune our approach to what's known as waypoint zero, which we're about 34 and a half minutes until we hit that. Uh, there's going to be three waypoints on the final approach to station, and we can either stop and hold at these waypoints, or if the teams give the go beforehand, they can just proceed through the waypoint on to the next one. And so waypoint zero is going to put us just 400 meters directly below the station. And so on board uh, Expedition 67 astronaut Raja Chari, who's in the station's cupola right now monitoring, um, he's going to be able to essentially look straight down at the at the Crew Dragon Endeavor. Um, after we pause at waypoint zero, since we're going to the zenith or the space-facing port today, Dragon's going to execute a maneuver to essentially fly 180 degrees around station. It's going to fly all the way to essentially the top part of station, just above it, uh, between it and the 
vastness of outer space and it's going to pause at what's known as waypoint one and when we're at waypoint one we're about 220 meters away from station so we're still outside that second imaginary checkpoint known as the keep out sphere um, which is a sphere around the station with a 200 meter radius and then same as waypoint zero we do a go no go right before we get to waypoint one and if the teams are go to proceed we can essentially hit waypoint one and then continue right through and that will bring us inside the keep out sphere and this graphic will show you what our approach is going to be like because again we're, we're going to the top side the top port on station we call it the zenith facing um, or the space facing port over on node two um, so we're going to get through waypoint zero swing up to waypoint one and pause just outside the keep out sphere and then once the teams get the go they'll continue in and we will stop again at what's known as waypoint two and that's just 20 meters away from that docking port. Um, and so that one we will typically hold at just to do final checks, final adjustments. Again, at this point, the station will be uh, under thruster attitude control. Um, and then Dragon, once it gets the go, will proceed in from waypoint two, again, flying autonomously for that slow approach until we hit contact and capture. And it's going to be docking. Uh, to one of the two international docking adapters we have on board the station. Um, one of them currently occupied by another Dragon, uh, Crew Dragon Endurance, uh, which carried the Crew 3 astronauts to the station last fall. Uh, but we're going to be going to the top one, um, international docking adapter number three uh, on the top port of the Harmony module. Now, after they make that initial contact and capture, uh, a couple of different steps have to happen before we get to what we call docking complete. Um, so the docking mechanism will start to draw Dragon in uh, to provide to essentially uh, start the hard mate process, and then a series of hooks around the outside of Dragon will drive, um, and that's what hooks and latches, uh, and that's what gives us a, a essentially a tight seal, a hard dock. Um, to the station. And then there's a number of other steps that take place. One of them, uh, the extension of two umbilicals that will connect Dragon's uh, power and data hard line to the station so it'll no longer need its solar arrays while it's docked to charge systems on board. It's just able to be fed power uh, through the station. Uh, also, giving it that hard line connection for data and communications through station. Uh, we have essentially a wireless connection right now uh, through something known as C2V2. It's the common communications for visiting vehicles. And this is what we use with visiting spacecraft to essentially enable uh, spacecraft to spacecraft communication. Um, so you might hear reference to the big loop uh, by the different, uh, either the flight control teams uh, or the astronauts on board Dragon and Station right now. And that is just tying in all of our different communication loops is uh, we operate on what's known as Dragon to Grounds for talking directly to Dragon, uh, and then Space to Grounds for talking directly to Space Station. And then when we take the big loop, we tie them all together into one. And so that way, anytime somebody's speaking either on Dragon or on Station or on the ground, they're all able to hear each other and talk to each other at the same time. So you have this constant two-way communication between all the different groups involved in these integrated operations. And so we use that C2V2, that common communications for visiting vehicle link to establish that, that not only gives us the uh, audio communications, um, but it also uh, enables uh, dragging commanding through the station, uh, both for operators here on the ground, uh, like the team out at SpaceX Hawthorne, uh, or also the crew on board station. Um, as said a couple of times, all of this flight is done autonomously, but we have the ability to manually override, to manually take control, to manually issue abort commands um, from several locations, primarily SpaceX Mission Control and Hawthorne, uh, or the crew monitoring on board the space station, which today is Rasha Chari of the Expedition 67 crew, the NASA astronaut. And so he's able to essentially monitor data from Dragon, but can also uh, send commands to it if required. We also use C2V2 for that, that relative GPS navigation that I was talking about. We have 
GPS uh, sensors and receivers on Dragon, and then a GPS system on board station, and those two passing data back and forth uh, to help with Dragon's relative navigation, just its navigation during these burns and its approach to the space station. So that was one of the, the major checkpoints uh, that started integrated operations, was getting that command link set up, um, and that was done successfully a little over an hour ago. And so we've, we've already been hearing communications on the big loop, um, and we know that the, the crew has been able to verify their command paths, and we're just continuing to follow along now with this approach. We're about eight minutes away from that mid-course burn, and that will just fine-tune our approach up to waypoint zero. Uh, the teams here will do a go-no-go no go, um, for approach or basically flight through that waypoint uh, about 10 minutes before we're scheduled to arrive. And you're continuing to get a view of Dragon, so you can see the, the red and the green navigational lights and then uh, the flashing one, which is coming right down the center line of the docking port. Um, Dragon's continuing to close in. We're just about 2.8 kilometers away, uh, right now closing at a rate of about 3.2 meters per second. And it's going to continue until we hit just 400 meters in distance from the station. Again, we're going to be right underneath um, as we reach waypoint zero, and we're going to be in, we're going to be inside the approach ellipsoid uh, in about 14 minutes from now, and then swinging up to waypoint zero, just 400 meters below the station, uh, before we either pause there for a moment or continue right on and do that that big swing, that about 180 degree flight up around into the top part of station, and that'll put us onto waypoint one which is on what's known as the docking axis, essentially meaning you're lined up directly uh, with the port that you're gonna be docking with. And for us today, that is the, the Zenith, the space-facing port on node two. And then if you're just joining, you're still getting a live look at Dragon. Uh, we're just about six minutes away from the mid-course burn. And we are just under an hour and a half from our expected docking time. We are expected to dock at about 6.45 a.m. Uh, here in Houston, 4.45 in the West Coast. That's 11.45 GMT. Uh, all told, it's going to be about a 20 and a half hour journey from launch to docking. We're 19 hours and one and a half minutes into the flight so far. Um, so just the final phases of approach coming up soon. Uh, but once they dock, the AX-1 crew members are going to be joining the Expedition 67 crew in progress on board the station. We've got seven individuals living on board the station right now. Um, among them, uh, you have the crew that arrived on a separate Crew Dragon, Crew Dragon Endurance, um, on NASA's SpaceX Crew 3 mission. And they are led on board the station right now by NASA astronaut Tom Marshburn. Here's a, a, a fun quick shot of them in their crew quarters. Um, Tom Marshburn's up on the top there and is the current Expedition 67 commander. Um, down on the bottom was the uh, crew three commander Raja Chari, and then again Marshburn's going to be prime for uh, a lot of the hatch operations. Chari, uh, seen here, is inside the cupola right now, and he's doing the monitoring uh, of the Dragon's approach, and he's been uh, following along uh, as it's gone through its approach initiation. I'm um, also on board of Crew 3 was the NASA astronaut Kayla Barron making her first flight into space along with Chari. Um, and she's going to be helping with some of the hatch ops, so we'll probably see her uh, floating in and out of view um, as we get past docking. Uh, and then also on the Crew 3 mission from the European Space Agency was ESA astronaut Matthias Maurer also making his first flight into space. And so that rounds out the, the Crew 3 crew that's on board. Uh, just a few weeks ago, though, they were joined 
by a Soyuz vehicle, which carried three Russian cosmonauts, uh, led by the Soyuz commander Oleg Artemyev there in the center. Um, making a return to the space station, he was joined by Denis Matiev and Sergei Korsakov. So we're going to see all seven of those crew members when we get to our welcome ceremony later this morning as they get ready to welcome the AX-1 crew on board. And we expect that to take about two hours after docking until we get there. So after we dock to the space station, um, a couple of things will happen in parallel. On board the Dragon, the AX-1 crew will be able to get out of their seats, get out of their suits, and begin to configure the Dragon cabin for docked operations. There's a couple of steps they need to go through. Um, one of the first things they do uh, once we get the hatches open is to remove what's known as a Lyo canister. It's lithium hydroxide. That's the system Dragon uses to scrub carbon dioxide from the vehicle uh, during free flight. As after we get docked, uh, not only power and data get integrated into the station, but the atmosphere gets integrated into station. And they'll be running uh, what's known as an IMV, an intermodule ventilation duct. Uh, and that just helps provide positive um, flow to mix the atmosphere on board Dragon with the rest of the space station. Um, so that's just a couple of the steps that we'll take after we get docked. Um, while the crew is on Dragon is getting out of their suits, the crew on station essentially starts stepping into steps uh, to get the hatches open. Uh, NASA astronaut Tom Archburn is going to be the primary one going through what's known as hatch and pre uh, vestibule pressurization. We open in a small valve on the hatch on the station side to flow atmosphere from station into that small space between uh, the Dragon hatch and the station hatch. And we are going to stick with you uh, all the way through docking, through hatch opening, until we get to that welcome. Um, so we're just a little over a minute coming up to this mid-course burn. I'm going to stop talking for a moment. I want to toss it over uh, to Tricia and Andy for a quick check in at Hawthorne as we're getting good views of Dragon and we're going to get better ones coming up real soon. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, a lot, a lot, a lot to unpack here, Tricia. Uh, as Dan mentioned, this is uh, a live view, if you are just joining us, of the Ax uh, Axiom-1 mission. Uh, so Dragon is about two kilometers away from the International Space Station, making its way to waypoint zero, which is going to be uh, 400 meters away. And then um, there are more milestones that it'll uh, need to go through um, before it docks in about an hour. So, um, you know, we are watching Dragon, uh, but things will definitely begin to pick up pace here uh, as we get uh, closer and closer to the International Space Station. Absolutely. What an exciting time for uh, the four-person Axiom crew who are on their way to the ISS right now. Um, you know, for three of them, it's their first time experiencing something like this. Uh, they've, uh, all four crew members have certainly been very busy leading up to the launch and up to this moment with, you know, hours and hours, I believe 700 to 1,000 hours of training that they had to go through uh, in order to, you know, be prepared for this type of experience, for working on the ISS. And, uh, you know, for uh, achieving the objectives that they're going to be doing over the next eight days. Yeah, and if you um, have been uh, following this mission uh, since uh, launch yesterday morning, uh, we did have an on-orbit live event about three hours ago. And, uh, you know, to, to quote Larry Connor, uh, he had said that uh, he tried eating a muffin and uh, he, uh, things did not go as planned. So uh, despite the 700 to 1,000 hours of training, I think getting used to uh, living and, and operating in a microgravity environment uh, can be tricky, but, uh, you know, the, the team has, a ton of science uh, ahead of them in the next um, 10 days or, or nine days now. Um, uh, um, so uh, right now, you know, they're, they're getting acclimated. They woke up uh, about four hours ago. And so um, you, we saw uh, shots inside of Dragon. Um, they have their suits on. We heard that uh, we had 
four good leak checks. And so um, they're seated, they're strapped in, and um, in about an hour, they're going to be docking and um, uh, you know, hopefully uh, seeing the rest of the crew uh, shortly. Absolutely. And, you know, they, like you mentioned, they have a jam-packed schedule for the next uh, eight to nine days that they're going to be on orbit. The uh, four-person crew are going to be responsible for um, just about 25 experiments and over 100 hours of crew time dedicated to research, as well as outreach activities uh, that, you know, they'll be addressing several uh, science, technology, and um, art-based uh, outreach events. So, you know, they have a uh, busy schedule coming up ahead. And, you know, as you mentioned on the On Orbit Live event, we saw a little bit about how they were acclimating to the zero-G life. Uh, the three who have never flown before, they were still getting the hang of how to uh, orient themselves in a microgravity environment. And it's, it's certainly harder than it looks. Um, I was able to actually personally, a few weeks ago, be a part of a zero-G flight um, along with several of my colleagues from Axiom Space where we were testing out some hardware for the station, and it was uh, it was pretty difficult not to just <laughs> you know go flying down the the cabin of the airplane um, when we were in those microgravity um, moments. So, you know, pretty tough. Yeah, it, it really just is a testament to um, you know all of the training that the crew uh, had to uh, go through to be ready for this mission. Uh, but you know, as Dan was setting up, uh, we were anticipating the mid-course uh, burn, which is essentially a, a, a minor correction burn uh, if Dragon needs to sort of uh, you know make minor adjustments uh, to align itself and and ensure that it's on the right course to waypoint zero. That burn has completed and it completed successfully, no issues. Uh, so with that, we're going to send it back over to Dan at uh, JSC in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy and Tricia. So yeah, as Andy just said, we had a good mid-course maneuver. We heard that they have converged on waypoint zero, which is going to be our stop point. And this appears to be a view from Dragon closing in on the space station. They're just a little over a kilometer away and continuing to close in. They've slowed down to just about 1.7 meters per second, uh, but we should be coming up on waypoint zero, moving them just 400 meters below the station in about 16 minutes. And we're getting a look over the shoulders of uh, the commander and pilot seats. And in that center screen, you're able to see uh, their expected flight path. So you can see it's swinging up. Uh, the station is at the top of that screen uh, in the uh, crosshair and they're going to stop just 400 meters directly below and then they're going to execute a maneuver to fly up and over top the station getting onto their docking axis looking at the space facing port on Harmony before they begin the final approach and now we'll go side by side and we should be getting a sunrise in about a minute or so so we'll see things start to light up you can already see uh, the station itself starting to enter into an orbital dawn as both of these spacecraft right now are flying just over the southern part of the Pacific Ocean about to begin a pass over South America. So with that successful mid-course burn, we're, we're essentially done with all the major uh, burns during this approach. We're just going to be now using uh, some of the Draco thrusters for these uh, translational moves through the different waypoints. Uh, we've got three waypoints. We're going to go through waypoint zero, waypoint one, and waypoint two. Zero just 400 meters below the station. Waypoint one, 220 meters directly above the docking port on the space facing side. And then waypoint two, just 20 meters away from docking. So they're going to continue to close in. We're essentially using all of the service section Draco thrusters at this point. And so that was the Capcom here in Houston.
Capcom here in Houston, Scott Segati, giving the call up to the crew, again, using what's called the big loop. So that's just all of our different communication loops, space to grounds to station and dragon to grounds to dragon all tied together, uh, allowing the team here in Houston, the team in Hawthorne, and the crew members on board station and dragon all to talk with each other. And Scott was radioing up essentially the procedure that NASA astronaut Roger Chari, who's doing the approach monitoring, is able to jump into. Um, and he is standing by in the station's cupola, and he is able to monitor getting real-time data fed through that bi-directional link from Dragon to the space station. He's also able to send commands to the vehicle. So in addition to uh, having that human oversight inside Dragon and on the ground in Hawthorne, you've got the station crew in the loop as well. But everything has proceeded very smoothly so far today with the automated rendezvous. And you heard we're, we're less than a kilometer away, so Dragon at this point inside the approach ellipsoid. It's going to continue to approach. We've got about 450 meters to go. We should get to waypoint zero in just a hair under 13 minutes from now. And at this point, the teams are going to start doing their go-no-goes for each of the different waypoints. So uh, again, we can get to these waypoints and we can pause if we need to either stop and make sure that uh, the relative navigation is functioning, if we run into any issues with thrusters, any issues on station, um, or if everything continues to be green, we just continue right past these waypoints and we'll go from zero to waypoint one pretty quickly. And so just about 12 minutes away from that next stop, uh, we might occasionally see some thruster firings uh, on board Dragon when we get the views from the space station. Uh, at this point, we're using what's known as and that was Rajachari radioing down that the attitude of Dragon is as we expect it. Again, Dragon controlling its attitude with a number of different sensors. One of the primary ones, just an inertial measurement unit, which uses accelerometers and gyroscopes uh, to understand Dragon's relative position. Uh, also using, for this final approach, Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground, com check. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to Ground, loud and clear. Hey Larry, on Dragon to Ground, wanted to let you know that we're not getting any response on the big loop. Uh, Jake uh, understood and uh, will investigate at our end. SpaceX and Deborah dragging the ground out of here. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. We had you three by three there. Okay, I re rogered your uh, call a little while ago. That's another comp check, both on the big loop. I guess you didn't hear me. Okay, copy all. We've got you on Dragon to Ground. Recommend another comm check on the big loop. All right, Captain, that didn't work. This Endeavor on Dragon. Uh, sorry, I'm a big one. Out of here. 
Hey Mike, we had you three by three there. Not sure if you did anything differently, but that seemed to work. I don't think I did, but I'm glad it's working now. Okay, so a couple of quick updates. The crew was given the go to proceed through waypoint zero, on through waypoint one, and all the way through waypoint two. So we're gonna see Dragon step through these different waypoints pretty quickly. So we're just under 200 meters away from waypoint zero, and we're approaching station from below. That's why you're seeing the Earth's surface start to come into view as we're heading into that orbital sunrise. Dragon right now about 570 meters in closing. We are about eight minutes away, a little less than eight minutes at this point until we hit waypoint zero. It's gonna autonomously proceed through waypoint zero and it's gonna execute kind of a mini fly around maneuver. So swinging about 180 degrees from the bottom of station all the way up top. And that's gonna put it onto the docking axis lined up with that docking adapter on the space facing side of the node two module. And that'll put us at waypoint one, which is just 220 meters away from station. And then they'll proceed immediately from there down to waypoint two, getting just 20 meters away from the docking port before we pause and then do that final go, no go for approach. <coughs> Once we get into that final approach, Dragon will slowly fly in again, just using those service section Dracos. Um, until it's just a few meters away, and then we'll hear a call out for what's known as CHOP. That's crew hands-off point. That's essentially just giving the crew a heads up not to initiate any manual aborts or try any manual control, because at that point, that close in, everything has to be done automated by the computer itself on board Dragon. So you'll hear CHOP call out just a couple of seconds before we get contact and capture. We were slated to dock uh, just a little over an hour from now, an hour and seven minutes. Um, but as we continue to move through the burns, we'll adjust that in real time. We are just five minutes, 45 seconds away from waypoint zero. And we're about to see uh, South America passing beneath the Dragon spacecraft as it's just about to pass over Chile. We're fully into that orbital sunrise at this point. We're gonna have good lighting uh, for at least another 50 minutes until we enter into an orbital nighttime. And we're just five minutes away from waypoint zero, continuing to close in, just about 475 meters away from station. Again, during all of these maneuvers, we're using those, those Draco thrusters on board Dragon. We've got 16 of them around the vehicle. There's four in the forward bulkhead, which is what's looking directly at our camera right now. And as we get in closer, you'll be able to see those. Uh, they've got um, some larger expansion nozzles on them and they're used for really the, the big pushing burns um, that Dragon executed over the last 19 hours to catch up to the space station. Um, as they're now pointing directly at station, you can probably guess we're not using those for these maneuvers at this point. Uh, we're using instead the ones around Dragon's service section. So that's just around the, the bottom part of the capsule, still on the capsule, not on uh, the trunk which occupies the space typically called the service module on other spacecraft. All of these thrusters are built directly into the Dragon spacecraft itself. Um, they're essentially around the same area that the really large Super Dracos are. Those are only used 
um, for abort scenarios on uh, either on the pad or during ascent, and then as soon as we get on orbit, those get disabled for the remainder of the mission. So those are not going to be used for anything today or anything for the rest of uh, the Crew Dragon Endeavor's flight. But we are using uh, the service section Draco thrusters. Each one of these provides about 90 pounds force of thrust. Um, so used for these uh, only maneuvers in space in vacuum, uh, but also attitude control during uh, the final phases of reentry. Uh, they're in clusters of three, so we've got four clusters of three of these thrusters around uh, the base of the capsule, and these are going to be used for attitude control, so just which way the, the vehicle's pointing, um, but then also for uh, those translational moves. So we're going to be doing one of those uh, in a little over three minutes after we get to waypoint zero, and we're going to see Dragon start to fly first out in front of the station, and eventually swinging just up over top until we get to waypoint two. We're just 430 meters away. So again, we're just about three minutes away from waypoint zero. And again, Dragon has a couple of tools available to it um, for this approach, for its navigation. Um, when we establish that bi-directional communication, we're able to establish what's known as relative GPS, so you have basically a GPS system on Dragon, talking to a GPS system on board the station, trading their relative state data, uh, as that provides the Dragon flight computer data to fine tune its maneuver. Well, as we're getting in close now, uh, we're gonna start using some of the navigational elements on the very forward part of the Dragon spacecraft. Uh, these are covered up by the, uh, the nose cone during ascent, and then one of the first things we do when we get the nose cone open um, is you reveal these sensors that are going to be used for the approach and docking. Uh, you've got the Dragon Eye, which is use, um, uses uh, what's commonly known as a LIDAR system, um, basically using lasers that bounce off of uh, reflective points on station to give distance data, range rate data, how quickly you're closing in. Um, we're also able to use uh, a thermal and an infrared camera. Um, there is a just a visible light camera on the very forward part of Dragon um, that will typically get some views. We got some views of the station from that earlier. That's not part of the actual navigation at all. That's just used um, for situational awareness. It can also be used uh, should the crew have to take over manual control. That'll be one of the uh, things feeding data into their manual control uh, piloting software that's built into those displays that uh, anytime we get a look over the uh, commander and the pilot's shoulder inside the capsule, you'll be able to see those displays and uh, they'll just have those up to monitor the approach, but then they can also use that um, should they need to take control and fly Dragon manually for any reason. So we are just about 30 seconds away from waypoint zero, just 411 meters away from station. So just a small bit to go, and then we'll be passing through our first waypoint. Again, we're gonna hit three of these on the way to docking today. We're gonna start with waypoint zero swinging up to waypoint one, just 220 meters away, and then eventually into uh, waypoint two, just 20 meters from the docking port. Uh, meanwhile, preparations on the station continue. We've done a couple that I talked about earlier just to get ready for this approach. Uh, we do something called feathering the solar arrays. It's just essentially pointing them in a direction to minimize their surface area that's pointing towards Dragon. Uh, as Dragon does these thruster firings, you're essentially expelling some gases, some um, some prop out into the vacuum of space, and that can leave residues on any sensitive surfaces. And so we just orient the, the solar arrays to basically show as little surface area as possible in the direction of these thruster firings, and just to minimize any residues getting on the solar cells. And this is standard for any visiting vehicle operation, and that's just one of the first uh, steps that you take as you get into these final approaches. Uh, we've also transitioned the station's uh, MCS motion control Space system. Two. Dragon attitude is as expected.
was NASA astronaut Rajachari radioing Dragon Attitude as expected. So we've now uh, just passed waypoint zero. We're inside 400 meters away from the space station. And at this point, we're going to see Dragon start to do a maneuver, taking it up out in front of the station and then up over top, heading up to waypoint one. So it's going to essentially do a 180 degree swing around the station, going from directly beneath to directly above. It's going to line it Dragon up with SpaceX uh, on the big docking loop. adapter. Approach zero in progress. Trajectory has converged on waypoint one. Expect waypoint one arrival at approximately 1121 UTC. And then that call we just heard from CORE. So uh, the trajectory has aligned on waypoint one, and that's where we're headed next. That's that point right above the station. Uh, and we expect to be there uh, in about 34 minutes from now. Uh, all the times you're hearing called up are in uh, UTC or GMT, just that uh, Greenwich Mean Time, that universal standard time. Uh, and that's what all of the different operators working space station ops will go off of as you have control centers in just about every time zone imaginable. Um, and so we use that UTC just to tie uh, everybody's planning and tracking together. So we're about space 34 minutes from waypoint one. On dragging dragon the ground. Hey Dragon, we've got you on dragging the ground. Jake, did you get uh, Mike's transmissions both on the big band dragon to ground? Larry, that's a negative on both. Did not receive either transmission. I wonder if it's a Vox setting or uh, past that, I'll keep thinking. Not sure. Thanks, we'll investigate on our end. And so we've heard them continue their, their troubleshooting a couple of uh, different issues with the big loop, but we're still continuing to get that calm um, and not any uh, impedance towards Camera continuing with our docking so far today. Dragon SpaceX, we got the last half of that call. SpaceX Endeavor on dragging the ground. Yeah, Jake, I'm not sure what to do here. Uh, I don't think it's a box setting because I'm definitely pressing the press to talk. I'm seeing the transmit light, light up when I'm talking the whole time, so I'm not sure what to do. Worst comes to worst, we rely on Larry to make the calls. Okay, copy all, MLA. I had you three by three on that call. Understand you don't think it's a Vox issue. Uh, would encourage troubleshooting, and I'm sure you are. Uh, we'll stand by for another big loop comm check. Roger that. All right, we're continuing to check off milestones during this approach. We're already past waypoint zero on our way towards waypoint one. Dragon continuing to fly. As they MLA, continue to do a number of SpaceX communication the checks with the ground. We caught the second half of that call. Recommend pressing push to talk uh, and waiting a few seconds before starting a call. Endeavor, copy. How do you hear this transmission? 
Dragon, we caught that entire transmission. All right, but right now, Dragon making it swing from waypoint zero to waypoint one. We're just about 30 minutes away until Dragon's directly above the station and lined up on the docking axis with that international docking adapter. Uh, let's check back in with the Hawthorne team, though. Uh, Andy Trish, how's everything going over there in California? Uh, things are going good here, Dan. Um, uh, as we continue to watch Dragon, uh, things are uh, beginning to pick up pace as Dragon makes its way towards Waypoint 1. Uh, you know, for everyone tuning in, uh, we are hearing dialogue between Larry, Connor, the pilot uh, who is currently in Dragon Endeavor, uh, and uh, the CORE, which stands for Crew Operations uh, Resource Engineer here in Hawthorne. Uh, they are troubleshooting some communications um, so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll likely continue to get uh, updates there, but uh, you also notice that there are some beeping uh, before the communications happen. Those are called, called Quindar tones, and uh, those are really just used to clear the air to make sure that the communication um, is as clear as possible from ground to dragon. Uh, but, you know, as part of the Axiom 1 mission, this is uh, SpaceX's sixth human spaceflight mission overall and the fifth to the orbiting lab. Uh, Dragon has a long, long history of really being designed from the beginning with human spaceflight in mind. Uh, there is um, the uh, first Dragon capsule that is hanging uh, behind myself and Trisha here in Hawthorne. Um, and even uh, on the days of its inception, there was a window in place. And we weren't uh, sending people up into space at that time, but we knew that uh, sometime in the future we, we wanted to. So um, this, it's super exciting that, uh, you know, I, I can't believe I'm saying it, but it, this is the sixth time that, that you know, we're, we're sending people up on Dragon. Yeah, that's certainly amazing. And if I understand correctly, that, that first Dragon capsule was sent up with cheese? Yeah, um, the cheese was used as a mass simulator uh, for um, that, that capsule, and we've definitely come a long way since then. But uh, even between that capsule and what we're seeing here today, there has been numerous upgrades uh, to the Dragon capsule. Um, you know, first and foremost, with every flight uh, where we're taking crew, um, when they return, we, we collect all of the feedback to make sure that the next iteration of crew flight is as comfortable and, and a, a well-versed experience as possible for the, the um, incoming crew. So things like adding USB chargers, uh, reorganizing where to store and pack things, those are all feedback that we take into um, uh, you know, reiteration of the Dragon's design. Uh, the, the Dragon capsule itself also has gone through a number of upgrades. Um, if you've been following um, the Dragon program, you'll notice that uh, we no longer have the solar arrays, uh, which would unfurl after Dragon separated from the second stage. The solar panels are actually built onto the trunk section itself. And so, um, you know, as Dragon gets closer, we'll likely see um, half of the trunk section colored black, and those are the, the solar panels that will collect energy um, and really power Dragon throughout its stay up in space. Absolutely, and you know, you mentioned that you guys, um, that SpaceX has had a, this is the sixth flight that you've had um, in collaboration with NASA, sending up NASA astronauts uh, to the ISS. Uh, this is um, Axiom's first, you know, um, mission in collaboration with companies like SpaceX and as well as our uh, government counterpart, NASA. It's a, this uh, first private astronaut mission is really setting the uh, precedent and serving as a case study for what these uh, partnerships and collaborations will look like in the future, you know, for future private astronaut missions, and as well as the Axiom station overall. Yeah, I think it's it marks a a, a turning point in in um, space travel. Uh, this is the first all private uh, mission, as you had mentioned. Um, and, and, you know, with all the signs that each of the crew members are going to be performing, um, it's just a tremendous, tremendous um, sort of milestone in the, in the space-faring um, uh, world.
Absolutely, and you know, in, in, for, in our view, it's really the next chapter of uh, the space flight industry. Uh, you know, during the launch broadcast, we heard uh, from Kathy Leaders uh, about how this was really the vision of space flight from the very beginning of NASA's program, you know, 60 years ago. They uh, really envisioned this to be, um, you know, what it would evolve to so that they could focus on, you know, returning to the moon, going to Mars, and possibly even beyond in the future. So, you know, this is um, the ISS and NASA has been, they've been the pioneers in these kinds of relationships, all the logistics and training and everything it takes to put humans into space and low Earth orbit. And transitioning that to a commercialized partnership is going to mean that, you know, private sectors, private industries are going to need a lot of time um, and NASA's expertise in learning how to establish and maintain these relationships effectively. It's really a learning process uh, through all of these missions, um, you know, to get there. That's a really gorgeous view of the curvature of the Earth. Yeah, I think um, when we had started this broadcast, we had a phenomenal view uh, of Dragon um, in the, uh, I believe it was an orbital sunset, uh, but it, it looked like a painting with all the colors and, and Dragon <laughs> in the foreground. And, um, you know, as Dragon approaches the International Space Station, we're going to continue to get... Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground for audio troubleshooting. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to Ground, go ahead. Hey Larry, uh, quick update. We are still seeing good suit to telemetry via the pressure transducer. We don't suspect an umbilical issue, uh, but we're hoping to gain some confidence in this comm method as we head towards waypoint one. Uh, hoping MLA can give one more comm check on the big loop using the press, wait a second or two, and then talk method. Yeah, copy all, and uh, Michael giving another go on the uh, big loop using the revised technique. Remember, I'm check on the big loop. Dragon SpaceX, I think we lost the S and P of SpaceX. Maybe another half second, but otherwise, sounds good. Okay, Jake, did you hear okay? That's a four by four call, MLA, uh, and good to hear. So again, the teams are continuing to work through and troubleshoot some communications. Um, looks like things are heading in the right direction. Uh, that, again, was uh, both MLA, the commander, and Larry, the pilot, talking to the core um, here at Hawthorne. Um, we talk about joint operations and, and all of the teams it takes to really uh, get vehicles to the International Space space station safely. Um, at Mission Control Houston, uh, there is a, a CAPCOM, which stands for Capsule Communicator. They're really responsible for uh, ground communications to the folks already aboard the International Space Station. Um, the flight director is adjacent to the CAPCOM, and they're really leading the team through major milestones. We also have ADCOs, which are um, attitude determination and control officers, and those that will uh, uh, that person's job is to control the attitude or orientation of the International Space Station. Um, so a lot of parties working together to make sure that um, the crew and the capsule um, and the folks at the International Space Station uh, are safe as we continue the stocking procedure. Absolutely. 
Um, and we also have our, for in terms of Axiom, we also have our own, um, you know, similar positions like that. Um, some uh, some uh, of those positions include the Axiom operations lead. This is essentially the equivalent to the flight operations director. They're in charge of leading the Axiom's flight control team. Um, and for the PAM missions, they're uh, in charge of performing and managing the communication with the Axiom crew. Uh, another uh, position that uh, will be especially relevant when the um, the crew gets on orbit and starts uh you know, conducting their research experiments, will, uh, will be the Axiom research officer whose job, um, whose responsibilities include uh, planning and coordinating Axiom payloads um, with the crew while they're on orbit, as well as interfacing with the payloads owners who are, you know, the research institutions that the crew and Axiom has partnered with um, to send up research into space. So on the right-hand side, we have a view over the shoulders of uh, the commander, MLA, and uh, Larry, the pilot. Uh, in the uh, nifty SpaceX uh, spacesuits, these are intra, uh, user, these are used for IVAs or intra-vehicular activities, are really meant and designed for use inside of Dragon. Um, they are really um, a sort of space uh, system uh, in and of itself. Uh, they are a one-piece design, so everything from the helmet to the gloves to the boots, they're all attached. Um, the helmet is 3D printed, and as Dan was mentioning earlier, um, there is an umbilical on the right thigh uh, that hooks up to each of the seats um, for the crew members, and in that umbilical, will house um, you know, communications for the astronauts to communicate to ground, uh, as well as um, uh, lines for nitrox, uh, which again is a combination of nitrogen and oxygen, same stuff that you would see in scuba tanks. Um, in the case of a depressurization event, the suits would um, inflate and you would get a nice flow of nitrox through to make sure that the astronauts are safe and have a habitable habitable environment, um, but for now you see that the visors are up and, uh, you know, every time that we we uh, don or, or put on the spacesuits, we, we always run our leak check to make sure that, again, in case of an event uh, where we're losing pressure, um, the astronauts would be safe. Beautiful shot there of the ISS on the right. So those suits, I mean, they they look pretty cool, but you know, they they are, um, from what I understand, pretty uh, comfortable for the crew. You know, that nitrous ox line it really serves to um, keep the crew comfortable um, and uh, c conditioned um, while they're wearing it, um, and it's pretty uh, pretty customized uh, for each crew member. Yeah, um, we, we do take a lot of measurements to make sure that the, the suit itself is form-fitted. Um, the chairs that they're sitting in are also um, able to be customized. There are different size buckets, small, small, medium, large, and um, the length of the armrest is also customizable. So um, comfort is definitely something that we take into mind uh, when we are suiting up um, the, the team members. So this mission um, really is a mission of first. The, the four-person multinational crew includes um, Michael Lopez Alegria, the first person to command a mission as both a government astronaut and a private astronaut. Larry Connor, the first uh, private astronaut pilot in spaceflight history. Uh, Eitan Stiba, the second Israeli astronaut and the first to live and work on the International Space Station. And Mark Pathy, who will become the 11th uh, um, Canadian astronaut. It's also the first mission to the space station with all commercial providers, including the ride to space, uh, the SpaceX Dragon launching on SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket. Certainly a very significant event for all of them and for the countries they're representing and really for the global uh, audience. Um, it also breaks new training ground. The AX-1 astronauts are the first all-private crew to complete NASA's training flow. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, each AX-1 crew member completed between 700 and 1,000 hours of training in safety, health, ISS systems, launch site operations, and additional training for research and technology demonstrations uh, and uh, uh, for their payloads to prepare for the mission. 
It's also a very serious science and research focused effort. Um, you know, more than 25 research investigations are planned during the mission, including some pretty cool Axiom Space Manage experiments like the Tesseray prototype, which is, uh, you know, a self assembling space habitat made, of a, made out of robotic tiles, and the JAMS air purification demonstration, where they're looking into uh, technology for, you know, for things like air purification. Um, all of these are very helpful and will definitely have implications for uh, life on Earth. Um, the crew members, uh, the you know three crew members who are the first time flyers, Larry, Mark, and Aton, they also uh, were able to curate their own research portfolios. Um, they worked with several research institutions, hospitals, museums around the world uh, to coordinate these experiments. And they'll also be able to host several science outreach and engagement activities while on orbit. Um, their research investigations range from biological studies, such as cells tied to help better understanding aging, to biomedical research on spine, cardiac, and brain health. Yeah, so on the right-hand side, um, you can see that um, the astronauts and crew members are interacting with the LCD screens. Uh, those will give the crew a ton of information about the vehicle, things like uh, altitude, uh, which engines are firing, and um, uh, right here, we, we just saw it, but we saw some plumes and, and bursts of, um, of, of the uh, Draco thrusters on Dragon. So uh, that view that was just up on screen, that is the International Space Station looking at Dragon as it approaches and continues to make its way towards Waypoint. It's about 220 meters away from the International Space Station. So things continuing to look good there. Uh, this shot here is a view of uh, Mission Control in Hawthorne. Um, and uh, um, uh, uh, before, when we had the, the dual pan up, we also had a view of Dragon looking at the International Space Station. So uh, very, very cool views. Absolutely. Some of the other, you know, really fantastic uh, technology that uh, the crew will be looking at on board, in particular, Mark Pathy will be testing a 3D two-way holoportation device. Uh, you know, the self-assembling space habitat wasn't exciting enough. They'll be uh, looking at this holoportation device, which is a mixed reality app using special lenses to project images via holograms. The innovation could be used to connect astronauts with loved ones on Earth on future long-duration space missions to combat feelings of isolation and loneliness. And you know, as NASA sets their sights on you know going to returning to the Moon, going to Mars, and you know even beyond, those questions and behavioral wellness issues become you know more and more relevant, um, you know, in those situations. Yeah, it was uh, super neat to read all about all the science that's being done, specifically the, the, the test array experiment where you have uh, these modules that can be uh, packed and sent up to space uh, in, uh, nice and flat. And then in space, they are self-assembling, which is, uh, you know, sort of mind-blowing to think about. Um, and, uh, you know, the crew is also partnering with, with the Trish um, uh, Research uh, Institute to um, study basically all the things that happen to your body when you're in a microgravity environment, and all that data is collected uh, and returned back to Earth, and um, you know can be used for future science endeavors, which is um, super awesome that the crew is doing this. Absolutely, and I want to go back and touch on the um, that Tesseray experiment. You mentioned that you can you're able to pack it flat and then send it up into space, where it's then you know self assembling essentially. That is um, a huge savings in terms of up mass, um, which, you know, directly translates to cost um, for missions like that. So, you know, usually when, for example, we send up a module, uh, this, you know, becomes relevant for Axiom Station, you have to send the module, you know, structure assembled um, and then launch that up into space. But with technology like the self-assembling robotic tiles, you know, the Tesseray experiment, you could potentially send that you know, flat, save a lot of space and a lot of mass, and then have that assembled in orbit um, by itself, which saves also a lot of crew time um, when talking about outfitting um, modules in space. So just some super exciting experiments um, in manufacturing research that could also help to benefit uh, us on Earth. I mean, I can think of a lot of ways that self-assembling tiles would benefit, um, you know, the manufacturing industry here every day. Yeah, it would be super cool to basically 
potentially buy a self-assembling home and just <laughs> yeah, set it up. <laughs> it really would. <laughs> um, we don't have any shots of uh, Dragon and or the ISS right now, but I'm sure we'll get them back soon. Uh, as Dragon continues its way towards uh, Waypoint 1, which is um, sh it should reach in under 15 minutes here and makes its way towards uh, Waypoint 2, this is also the point where its soft docking ring will start to uh, deploy. Uh, the way that the Dragon works in terms of docking is there is a soft docking ring, and on that ring are three pedals. And as Dragon makes contact with the um, docking adapter on the International Space Station side, that those pedals and docking ring are what makes first contact. And so it'll sort of um, attach itself via those rings and pedals. And then there are two sets of six hooks that will drive into place and um, that will be what we call hard capture. And so at that stage, that's when um, you know, sort of docking is complete, but it's done in, in a couple of different um, stages. Absolutely. So, and, yeah, um, so sorry, we, we <laughs> might hear the call out that um, that procedure has started. So you know, Tricia and I will definitely be listening in for that. Yeah, we certainly will be. Um, in the meantime, though, it's uh, noteworthy to, it, it's worth spending time on the fact that, you know, the crew is representing four different countries, America, Spain, Israel, and Canada, for outreach in five different languages. So, you know, a large component of their mission objectives are um, conducting excellent science. But in addition to that, they're also helping to inspire people on Earth to pursue science and engineering studies. The crew represents, as I mentioned earlier, four countries and will com be completing uh, outreach experiments and uh, events in five languages, specifically Spanish, Hebrew, French, English, and Arabic, which you know just helps to uh, uh, contribute to expanding efforts to connecting with more people around the world. Um, you know, the crew is able to bring up some, um, you know, things as well. And, and Stibber will be br uh, bring surviving pages of the diary written in space by the first Israeli pilot, uh, Israeli astronaut, uh, Ilan Ramon, who died um, February 1st, 2003, when Space Shuttle Columbia and crew perished during reentry. He will also bring a painting created by Ramon's daughter and a song written by his son. So definitely a great nod to, um, you know, the first Israeli astronaut. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, in a similar vein, uh, uh, Larry Connor will be, sh he shares an Ohio heritage with actually the Orville and Wilbur Wright, uh, who he will also be bringing along a small piece of cloth used by the Wright brothers on the first ever powered flight at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina in 1903. So, you know, a lot of history there and, you know, being represented on the ISS. Um, it's just the beginning, really, for Axiom Space. AX-1 is the first of several proposed Axiom missions to the orbiting laboratory, and it's an important step towards Axiom's goal of constructing a private space station, um, Axiom Station, in low Earth orbit. Um, it'll serve as the global academic and commercial hub, and like I mentioned earlier, will really be the next chapter in opening up low Earth orbit to um, in research institutions and even governments um, around the world. So for now, we are um, under 10 minutes now uh, for Dragon to reach Waypoint 1, uh, getting awesome views of Dragon. So um, the hatch is open, and there is a center line camera uh, at the center, um, basically, of Dragon. That That is what Dragon is using to line itself up with the um, uh, docking target on uh, the International Space Station. Um, but yeah, things are continuing to go smoothly. I'm um, going to send it back over to Dan at JSC uh, for updates. Hey, thanks, Andy and Trish. Uh, we are just seven minutes away from arrival at Waypoint One. And so Dragon right now only just under 330 meters away from the station. It's continuing this uh, spin from underneath station to directly above. We're gonna line up on the docking axis at waypoint one, just 220 meters away from international docking adapter number three, which is on the space facing port of the Harmony module. 
Harmony hosts both of the international docking adapters on the station right now, which is used for uh, all U.S. commercial docking vehicles. So far, Dragon, the only one to make use of it, both the cargo and the crew variants. And we've got another crew Dragon docked to station that delivered our SpaceX Crew 3 astronauts. And pretty soon we're going to have a second one, Crew Dragon Endeavor. So in just about six minutes, we'll hit waypoint one, and then we're going to continue on in from there. The team's already getting the go to continue into waypoint two. Uh, and waypoint two will be just 20 meters away from the docking port on that space-facing side of Harmony. And then we'll pause at waypoint two before we begin that final approach. And so all of this, again, being done autonomously by the flight computers, Onboard Dragon, we've got three redundant ones that are constantly calculating its position relative to the station. While we were still quite a bit further away, we were relying on GPS and star trackers uh, to fine tune Dragon's path towards the station. Uh, ever since we got in closer, we've been using uh, as the primary means the Dragon Eye system, which uses a combination of different navigational tools. Uh, one of the primary ones is a form of LIDAR laser range finding where we're essentially bouncing lasers off of reflectors on the station and then those sensors are able to tell how long it took for that laser to travel back and that gives you a distance output immediately. And so it's using those um, to constantly ping with station. Uh, Dragon Eye also has an infrared camera set up uh, that the crew can use should they need to take manual control. And we use infrared uh, as it doesn't matter what the lighting conditions are, that camera is usable. Um, so even if we're in a complete orbital nighttime, the crew could use that camera. Um, and there's a shot with the half moon also uh, in the distance behind Dragon as it is almost directly above space station at this point. We're just four minutes away from waypoint number one. Uh, and as Andy said, there's a couple of additional cameras on Dragon. Um, there's two pointing directly out of that top hatch. There's a centerline camera and one that's just known as a media camera, just giving us additional views of, Dra of Space Station from Dragon, um, not used at all in the actual guidance and navigation control, um, but just something that uh, we get to use uh, to bring you along for the ride and also importantly, just gives additional situational awareness for teams um, on just relative positioning of Dragon. But we've not had any issues so far with our approach. We're just about three and a half minutes from waypoint one. We don't have video from the space station right now. Unfortunately, we are gonna have a couple of gaps just as we get into the really interesting phases as Dragon gets in close, but we'll get that video back pretty quickly. Um, we have all of that signal coming down uh, from station through those TDRS, the tracking data and relay satellites. Uh, every once in a while, uh, the antennas that point towards those satellites might get blocked uh, by some piece of station structure, um, and that can cause the dropouts or when we're just uh, out of the range uh, of the satellites themselves, we'll usually do a, what's known as a handover as we just transition between the different TDRS satellites. But we'll have a little bit of blockage uh, during the final approach phases, but uh, we should have good views of Dragon during uh, that docking portion. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. We're two minutes out from waypoint one. Approach one and soft capture ring extension will begin shortly. Dragon will continue approach to waypoint two. As a reminder, manual impulsive retreat recovery is not permitted. All right, just two minutes away from waypoint one. All of this being done autonomously on Dragon. We've got Dragon, a couple of SpaceX additional on backstops Dragon ground. if needed. For your awareness, we did not get a read back on the big loop if one was provided. SpaceX Endeavor on Dragon to ground. Uh, we'll investigate and be back to you.
SpaceX Endeavor Dragon. We're about 90 um, seconds Jake away. Was, was provided a response, that is, and I waited probably two, maybe three seconds after keeping the mic to start speaking, so I'm not sure what else to do. Would you like to have Larry try a comp check on the big group? Copy all, MLA. We had you three by three there on Dragon to Ground. Good suggestion for Larry to try the big loop. We'll stand by. SpaceX is never on the big loop. How do you copy? Dragon, SpaceX, we've got you 5x5 five five on the big loop with an echo. Make sure you're only... Oh, sorry. Stand by. Uh, good to go. SpaceX, Endeavour Dragon to Ground. I think we'll let Larry be the uh, key transmitter on the big loop, and I'll switch to Dragon to Ground. Okay, MLA on Dragon to Ground, copy all, and understood. All right, so at this moment, while they were conducting those kind of final comp checks, again, we've been troubleshooting a few issues with uh, the spacecraft commander, Mike L.A., uh, to be able to talk on the big loop. But, Dragon uh, and station Pilot SpaceX Larry on the big Connor loop. Connor not having Expect any issues. configuration of the C2V2 link shortly. So they're going to reconfigure CTV2, that's the kind of communications for visiting vehicles. Copy, thanks, Tom. The station crew reporting Dragon in the attitude that they expect as they monitor Dragon during its final approach. Teams down here on the ground reporting that the docking station, ring the is beginning to extend out. That'll be used for the soft six, capture. And we're ready for docking. Copy that, Tom. Ready for docking. And that was Station Commander Tom Marshburn reporting the station crew is ready for the approach and docking. Uh, just as they continue to step through their procedures, you heard five and six. Uh, five actually has them get a cue to radio down to the ground that they're ready. Um, we'll also uh, hear a chop call out come. Uh, that's that crew hands off point as we get into the final stages of approach. But for right now, we are just under nine and a half minutes away from waypoint two arrival. Um, and so waypoint two is just 20 meters outside of the space station. Uh, we'll, we'll hang out there probably for about a minute or so while the teams do their final go, no go for docking. Uh, flight Director TJ Creamer here in the space station flight control room leading the integrated teams. So we've been in what's known as integrated operations for the last several hours. Um, and that just speaks to uh, the time when Dragon is close enough in towards the station, uh, when the SpaceX and the space station flight control teams are kind of working hand in hand as they go through all of these different checkpoints, getting the go from the station side before Dragon proceeds. And so the docking ring on Dragon is beginning to extend. That's going to be used for that initial contact and capture. Uh, Andy gave a really great description. There's three uh, pedals on the docking ring on Dragon that are basically going to guide it in um, for that first uh, capture moment with a passive system on the station side in that international docking adapter. Uh, after that docking ring then gets retracted, That'll bring Dragon close enough in to enable a series of 12 hooks. And that'll give us a hard mate after that point 
Uh, we can continue with a couple of the other post-docking activities, uh, like extending an umbilical that's going to integrate uh, hardline communications data and power between Dragon and the space station. So in the meantime, we're just about seven and a half minutes away from arrival at waypoint two. And per the timeline, just about 17 minutes and 45 seconds from our expected docking time, uh, which was originally slated at about 6.45 a.m. Uh, Central Time, 11.45 GMT. So again, that time is just updating uh, automatically onboard Dragon as it calculates its amount of time that it's going to spend at each of these waypoints, uh, the duration of the burns and the approaches. But at this point, we're under seven minutes away from waypoint two, dragging just about 144 meters away from the station. And as expected, we've slowed down quite a bit. So as we initially fly in, we're, we were flying at about three or four meters per second. And that was just the relative velocity between uh, the Dragon spacecraft and station. At this point, uh, we're closer to a crawl. We're moving at about three tenths of a meter per second as Dragon flies in. So it's just doing very fine fine tuning maneuvers at this point using those service section Dracos. So no thrusters are firing right now. It's still uh, coasting off of its forward momentum. We might see those thruster plumes fire depending on lighting conditions as we get uh, just up to waypoint two where we're gonna hold with Dragon just 20 meters away from the space station docking port. And there you can see some of those thruster firings now as the lighting conditions do change. Again, at this point, we're just using the service section Dracos. So they're around kind of the base of the capsule portion. There's 12 of them in total uh, in four clusters of three. And those are all being fired automatically. Uh, Dragon calculating its path in using the Dragon Eye at this point, bouncing lasers off the space station to see exactly how far away it is, what its uh, range rate, how quickly it's flying in, and then adjusting in real time using those Dracos. All right, so we are under five minutes away from arrival at waypoint two. So that'll be our final waypoint. And then we'll be ready for the final go, no go for docking, just about 15 minutes away from the expected docking time. So let's check in over at Hawthorne with Andy and Trisha, getting exciting, getting Dragon in real close. Uh, we're, we're in the final stages. How ready are you to see this Dragon dock to station? Uh, very ready. Uh, we continue to get awesome views of Dragon. Uh, we are about a minute and a half away from an orbital sunset. So, uh, Dan, uh, I think you had already predicted, but lighting conditions might change a little bit. Uh, but for now, things are continuing to go uh, super smoothly. Um, if you look closely um, at the center of Dragon, uh, Dan had talked a lot about the forward bulkhead thrusters. There are some uh, holes that you can see on the bottom um, of that circular um, uh, forward bulkhead. Um, there's two more that aren't really well lit, but um, those are where... Dragon and Station SpaceX, C2V2 link reconfiguration, and soft capture ring extension complete. SpaceX, Endeavor, copy all. So those are where uh, four of those uh, 16 uh, Dracos are housed, and we just heard that uh, the soft capture extension has completed, uh, which is a great milestone to hit as we are uh, getting closer and closer to uh, the International Space Station and docking just a few minutes from now. 
Yeah, if uh, you know, we're excited about docking, I can only imagine what the crew really feels like. You know, I'm sure, uh, you know, they've had a long journey to here, but once they get there and they're, uh, they ingress into the station, um, they'll be, you know, hitting the ground running. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the um, volume of science experiments that they'll be uh, completing while on orbit. Um, let's talk a little bit more in detail of what the uh, three first-time flyers are bringing to the station. So first off, our AX-1 mission pilot, Larry Connor, has partnered with several research institutions across the U.S. to study aging, heart, and brain health. He'll be a participant in studies as well on heart function and brain and spine health. He will participate in tests and MRIs before and after the emission to really test uh, the effects of microgravity exposure on the human body. He will also conduct cell cultures in space. Uh, he was specifically trained for this, um, you know, uh, to be able to handle these cells while on orbit. And he'll be studying how the aged cells respond to the microgravity and radiation of space as stressors as well. Next, our mission uh, specialist one, Eitan Stiba, is conducting a variety of studies selected from across Israel in partnership with the Ramon Foundation and the Israel Space Agency. He'll be study he will be monitoring eye health, cognitive performance, and stress while in space. Other topics selected for uh, the Rakia mission that he's flying under will uh, include the microbiome, fluidics and optics, plastics recycling, cardiovascular health, radiation protection, and other tests of technology and equipment. He will also be observing the Earth's atmosphere for thunderstorms to better understand how lightning is coupled in the upper and lower atmospheres. And on top of all of that, he will also, been, also be conducting several education and artistic activities to inspire children back home on Earth. This includes reading a Hebrew poem from space for the first time. Uh, and Mark Pathy has partnered with multiple Canadian research universities, the Royal Canadian Geographical Society, and the Montreal Children's Hospital to conduct a variety of STEM studies. For the Montreal Children's Hospital, Pathy is examining musculoskeletal pain. The aim is to better understand the genetics and cellular pathways of pain and how the microgravity environment could contribute to pain sensation. Pathy will conduct in other biomedical experiments as well. Never on the big loop. Uh, all visors down. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. We copy all. Expect a hold at waypoint two for ISS troubleshooting. Dragon systems remain healthy. Teams working on it. Stand by for more. Understood. Copy all, and we'll be holding that waypoint two. So, a quick update from the core: uh, things are all uh, looking well, and we are going to be holding at waypoint two, which is coming up in in about a minute uh, on screen. Uh, now that we've um, uh, we have an orbital night. Uh, Dragon, and you can see all of the different Draco thrusters around the service section of the capsule beginning to fire. Um, all of these micro adjustments and micro movements are all autonomous from the Dragon vehicle. As Dan had mentioned, um, the Dragon vehicle is extremely smart, um, and so it knows where it's at, where it needs, what it needs to do to maintain a position and uh, dock successfully here in a couple of minutes. So continuing on with uh, Mark Pathy's research, uh, he'll, be con uh, he'll be participating in other biomedical experiments as well. He'll be wearing a biomonitor while exercising to record heart, lung, and circulation performance. He'll monitor changes in sleep and eye health, and he'll also test an augmented reality device intended to assist with medical care in the event of an emergency. At Houston Station on the big loop, we show ourselves in step four of 1.102, confirm it's in hold. Attitude looks good, and we are still waiting for video views. Copy that, Tom. We are working on video right now. Stand by for more words. So as we're approaching waypoint two, uh, let's head back over to Dan over at JSC for some more updates. Yeah, 
Hey, thanks, Trisha and Andy. So as you heard, Dragon is at waypoint two. So we're just 20 meters away from station and we're holding here. Uh, all systems continue to be go. Uh, the mission director at Hawthorne has given their go for docking. Uh, we're currently just troubleshooting some video accessibility for the crew on board station before the station team's ready to give their final go for docking. So we'll just hang out here at waypoint two. Again, this is why we build in these different kind of checkpoints along the way. And we go through a series of go, no goes just to confirm everything's working as we expect before we continue in. So Dragon's just going to hang out here for a little bit, 20 meters away. The team's here on the ground in Houston troubleshooting video for the crew on board. Uh, they did report down that they're still getting good data from Dragon. It's in the proper attitude. Um, so everything looking good uh, from the station perspective. And as soon as we get this video, uh, trouble shot and figured out we'll be ready to continue on with docking it'll be pretty quick from that final approach just 20 meters away to the docking um, again we're going to have an initial contact and capture using the soft docking mechanism on board dragon it's been fully extended at this point and it's going to link up with that international docking adapter that just has a passive mechanism on it um, and then after that initial contact the soft capture ring will start to retract um, on the docking system on board Dragon, bringing it in um, for a hard mate, at which point we'll be able to engage 12 hooks uh, found around the uh, nose cone section of Dragon loop. to lock it in. FYI, we're trying to send video to SSC-8. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. The issue we're troubleshooting has to do with crew video from the centerline camera. Can you confirm that the Dragon crew is able to view the station through your center camera? Yeah, copy on the big loop uh, on SSC-8. We see the same indications. We've got a counting up ET time, but uh, no, no video indication. Copy that. Give us two minutes, and we're hoping it'll be there. Endeavor we'll watch it up. That's incredible. We have good uh, video on both center line one and center line two. Is that what you was that your question? Dragon SpaceX copied the first half, did hear the words good video. Uh, if you could uh, elaborate what the second half of the call was. SpaceX Endeavor, my call was that we have good video on both center line one and center line two cameras and displays one and three respectively. Copy all, Dragon. Thank you. Okay, so just to walk you through what we're listening to right now. Uh, there is a centerline camera on the Dragon spacecraft and that video gets transmitted wirelessly from the Dragon capsule over to the station uh, using that C2V2, that common communication for visiting vehicles. That's that connection that's been uh, sending uh, data, voice, video between station uh, and Dragon, allowing those crews to talk to each other, loop. but also allowing... Video should be on SSC-8. Can you check for us, please? Uh, yep, still no joy. We've got the lab camera pointed at that screen as well, so you can see what we're seeing. Copy, we see it. Still assessing. But again, essentially what we're trying to do is get the view from that centerline camera up to the crew uh, that they're able to watch that video through a display um, that has overlays just as part of the crew monitoring of that final approach. Is there uh, 
in the in essentially in the in the chain of command for monitoring dragon and also potentially sending abort commands or anything of that nature so uh, one of our flight rules is we need that centerline video to be available to the station crew um, and we did get confirmation that that camera is giving good video to the crew on dragon so the team's right now just troubleshooting a couple of steps to get that video to the SSC, the space station support computer that the crew's using for monitoring. So they're trying a couple of different computers. They're gonna try a couple of resets and reconfigs uh, to get that video up and running for the crew. So right now we're just hanging out at waypoint two or about 20 meters away from the space station. We can continue to hold here uh, while they troubleshoot. Um, and again, we're just we're just waiting for that video issue to get worked out for the crew. And then as soon as we get that, we can continue on with the docking, um, which will come shortly after we're able to depart waypoint two. Again, we're just going to hang out about 20 meters Roger, away from on station. On the big loop, we copy potential version issue right there. Lost the end of your cause. We went through a, a mask on KU. and then getting some views inside the Dragon capsule. And uh, one of the ones that we just had was that center line. So that's the video that we're working on getting uh, up to the station crew, which they then will have uh, on one of their station support computers. And it has an overlay over it um, that just shows uh, a couple of different telemetry feeds and on the big as well. Uh, and that's just said, part of run, their setup. KU. So yeah, on the Dragon docking monitor, the version that's open on the SSC-8 says Dragon docking monitor version 1.3. Uh, in the execute note, it says Dragon crew be version 3.1. So I don't know if those are just transposed or if there's actually a, a version misconfig. But what is what is possibly chosen on the SSCs is 1.3. Copy. Stand by. close and reopen that window while you're watching it if you want to see the choices that come up. In standby one, we are assessing. Give us one more minute. And Raja, back with you on two. First of all, thanks for uh, giving us the added information. The configuration you're seeing with the three decimal one and the one decimal three, those are expected. That's what we want you to see. For troubleshooting, what we want you to do is go to SSC 17 and SSC 8, close docking monitor on both, and then reopen only on SSC 8 in the lab. How copy? We'll close the uh, dragon docking monitor on 17 in the cupola and close it on 8 in the lab and then reopen it only on 8. Good copy, thanks. Okay, Capcom Scott Segati here in Houston giving some troubleshooting steps to NASA astronaut Raj Atari on board the station. Again, Dragon right now, we're just holding at waypoint 2, just about 20 meters away from the station while we troubleshoot an issue getting video from the Dragon centerline camera to the crew and their support computer on station. That's a requirement for their monitoring during this final approach. So Roger was just given the instructions to go to two of the different SSCs, the station support computers, one located in the station's cupola and then one located in the Destiny laboratory and he's going to essentially turn the monitoring application off on the computer on both of those and then return to the one in the Destiny lab to restart it and hopefully that will fix our video issue. So on everybody loop, just uh, that's on board. Uh, it is reopened on 8. We're seeing similar indications with a counting up MET and a no video at the top. Copy that. Stand by.
And so they're continuing to troubleshoot this view from Dragon, looking straight down the barrel of the international docking adapter, continuing to essentially just float stationary just about 20 meters away from that docking port. And again, we're continuing to go through some IT support steps, some troubleshooting uh, to get a live video from that centerline camera from Dragon over to the station crew on their monitoring computers as that's one of the requirements that's in place station Houston, for that on the final big approach loop. monitoring you please go hands off on SSC-8. We're going to do some configuration from here. Thank you. And so now at this point, the crew is going to go hands off. So SSC, again, that station support computer, essentially just a laptop um, that's used. There's several of them throughout all of station that the crew uses uh, to support different applications, different hardware, different experiments. Uh, so they're going to go hands off. And then the flight controller here in Houston, known as Pluto, uh, will essentially serve as the uh, IT support in this case. It's going to go on board and try and do some reconfiguration work remotely on the software. And then once we're able to get that uh, centerline camera video up and running for the crew, we can proceed. So they're just holding Dragon 20 meters away. Um, we have plenty of consumables, plenty of capability to remain here at Waypoint 2 for an extended period of time to troubleshoot. Um, so right now the AX-1 astronauts inside Dragon suited up, visors down just 20 meters away from the space station. And then while we continue to troubleshoot uh, this centerline video issue, getting it to the crew, um, once we get that completed, we'll be able to proceed with docking. And so this was the first hiccup in a, a pretty smooth flight so far uh, for Dragon on its way to the station. And all indications uh, from Dragon not tracking any issues on the spacecraft, and they were able to confirm uh, that we're getting that. any issues on the spacecraft, and they were able to confirm uh, that we're getting that centerline camera both on board and we're able to see it uh, down here on the ground, so just working. Uh, the disconnect Dragon, and getting it on towards Dragon the ground station for crew. status update. Go ahead, Jay. Hey, Mike. The station is working through a video routing issue for them to see what you are seeing on displays one and three. We obviously can't stay at waypoint two forever, but we are staying for now. We anticipate at least two hours of hold time limited by propellant. And I wish I could, but I can't comment for sure how long this hold will last. How copy? Jake, believe me, we feel your pain. Um, we understand what's going on. We'll stay here as long as you tell us. Copy all, Dragon. Sit tight. And we got an update from the core that we have at least two hours um, to troubleshoot. Hopefully not that long, but at least two hours of, of prop margin to continue to hold at waypoint two um, while they work this video routing issue. Uh, this is the last item. And then as soon as we get this centerline video up to the crew, we'll be able to proceed in uh, with the docking. They'll have everything that they need for their approach monitoring capabilities uh, on board the space station. And then we'll be able to proceed with docking. Um, this is the centerline camera on Dragon looking straight down at the station. And again, we're directly above them. So you're starting to see some city lights pass in uh, the distance there um, from those views. And we're going to continue in this orbital nighttime for about 13 more minutes, and then we'll see the sun start to rise. Uh, we will have a couple of gaps coming up uh, with some of our video coverage uh, right around the same time the sun starts to come up. Uh, but otherwise, we should continue to get pretty steady views from the space station. 
Again, we're just holding at waypoint two, Dragon just 20 meters away from its docking port. Uh, as teams here in Mission Control Houston troubleshoot a video issue, getting the view from that centerline camera on Dragon uh, to the crew, to one of their support computers that they're gonna use for monitoring during this final approach. And that's in our flight rules is just one of those items that needs to be operational before the teams can give the joint go uh, to continue in. So the teams are discussing what our options are while they continue to work through this troubleshooting steps. But we've got approximately two hours of margin uh, in the propellant for Dragon to just continue to hang here at waypoint two, just about uh, 20 meters away from the space station. So it's holding itself stationary, flying essentially in formation with the orbiting lab. And then once we get the center line video issue fixed, we can proceed in with the docking. And at this point, uh, the team here in Mission Control Houston has jumped in and uh, has been running some remote steps uh, from down here onto that support computer. Uh, the crew has gathered inside the Destiny Laboratory on board station at one of our two uh, monitoring stations, essentially. Uh, we have one down in the cupola in the window that looks directly down towards the Earth uh, where Rajachari was initially for the monitoring. Uh, we also have an additional one in the Destiny Lab, both also equipped with full robotics workstations uh, that we use for controlling the space station's robotic arm, uh, but also for these uh, monitoring of these visiting vehicle operations. So the team's just continuing to figure out what the issue could be. Again, we've confirmed we've got good centerline video camera on board Dragon uh, and teams able to see it down here on the ground and just trying to work what that disconnect is uh, with the crew on station getting that video. And this is Mission Control Houston again. We're just continuing to hold for the moment, waiting for teams to troubleshoot a video issue uh, on board. Again, one of the, the final Thank systems you, we have to have in place. Yeah, Roger, I wanted to give you an idea of what we're doing right here. So we have uh, a primary plan where Pluto is currently working right now to try to get an alternate means to get you video using VLC. We are working on that right now. 
If that does not solve this issue here, our backup plan is that SpaceX has a ground pass coming by at 1223, where they will be picking up video. Um, so the alternate plan will be once we hit there, we're going to try to pipe in the video uh, directly to you through that SpaceX ground site. Um, that's what we're looking at right now. We currently are at about two hours left that we can stay at Waypoint 2 at this point. I'll copy. Hey, copy. Uh, VLC plan Alpha is the primary plan. We see that um, SSC-8 uh, being worked. And then if that doesn't work, the backup plan is to try to get uh, video piped in once we have a SpaceX ground coverage of 1223 and copy about two hours of consumables to hold at uh, current position. Good copy. Thanks, Raja. And we just heard a recap of our current situation from the Capcom here in Houston, Scott Sagitti. So again, our advisors, so check us on the way in if we want to get cleared in. Houston Station on two for crew constraints. Dragon SpaceX on, on Dragon to Ground. I have to apologize, I didn't get your yeah, Just checking in if the crew no exercise um, constraint bands that is currently about to expire, if that will be uh, extended based on the current um, delay. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to Ground. Can you repeat your last? I'm going to mute my other channels and listen only to you. You know, Jake, I don't have the ability to do that, so I'd like to wait for this conversation to end on the big loop, and then I'll repeat it. So a quick recap of our current situation. Crew Dragon Endeavor still holding at Waypoint 2, just about 20 minutes away from its dock, intended docking port on the International Space Station. We've got about two hours, a little less now, of consumables, uh, essentially propellant, where we can continue to hold here at Waypoint 2 while we troubleshoot an issue getting video over to the crew monitoring on board the space station. So that's one of the uh, checks we have to have in place uh, for their ability to monitor final approach. So the Pluto flight controller here in Houston is going through a number of steps uh, right now, trying to get them video hey, through an alternate path uh, through a video program on board. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground, ready to copy. Jake, what I was saying is, in anticipation of uh, some kind of a practice, protracted delay here, we have raised our visors, so be sure to double check with us uh, if and when we get cleared to go back in. Dragon, copy all. Visors raised and absolutely understand. Uh, we'll be in touch uh, with any sort of forward plan. I'm sure you're copying on the big loop that troubleshooting is occurring. On the ISS side, uh, we've got a lot of chatter on the ground about what to do here. Uh, thank you for your patience. Understand visors are up, and I'll be in touch with more shortly. Good work, Jack. Thank you. And the AX-1 crew taking their visors up, seats or their suits not pressurized. Uh, as they continue to hold just 20 meters away from station. So again, we'll continue to hold here at Waypoint 2. Uh, the teams here on the ground troubleshooting issues, find, trying to find now an alternate path to get that centerline camera video to 
Rajachari and the crew on station who have to monitor during that final approach. Uh, if their current troubleshooting doesn't work, we've got a ground pass coming up in about 24, 25 minutes from now um, where Dragon will be passing over a SpaceX supported ground site, which also has the capability to get that center line video down. And then we'll have another option to try and route that over to the space station crew. So troubleshooting continued. We're gonna wait until we get the center line camera video up and running before we continue with the docking. Uh, but for now, we're just stepping through the troubleshooting. So with that, why don't we jump over and check in with Andy and Trisha, uh, as again, we're just standing by here for this issue to get resolved. So Andy. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Uh, Trisha and I are also, you know, standing by and uh, hopefully we hear good news uh, from all of the folks uh, here uh, 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 back on Earth uh, trying to troubleshoot the video issue. Um, you know, as you, uh, you as you had mentioned, um, it's been otherwise a very very smooth ride uphill, and this is really the first hiccup that we've seen. So, again, um, we have a couple of options that we are looking into, but uh, for now, um, Dragon is just parked about 20 meters away at waypoint two, waiting for a path forward. So Dragon has been uh, on its journey to the International Space Station um, for about 20 hours now. And so after Dragon had separated from Falcon 9, it began what we call the activation and rendezvous phase of the mission. During this phase, Dragon uh, uh, was configured for on-orbit operations. This phase begins after Dragon separates from Falcon 9 and ends with the completion of the final colliptic burn. The initial orbit that uh, the Dragon was in was about 190 kilometers by 210 kilometers. Those values represented the perigee and the apogee of the orbit respectively, or in other words, the lowest and the highest point over Earth. That means that the orbit wasn't a perfect circle, but you know, more like a, a slight ellipse. Yeah, and over um, the next couple of hours, Dragon executed a series of burns, which gradually raised its orbit to align more closely with the station. Um, on screen right now is a graphic. Um, so there are four major burns or firing of the Draco thrusters on Dragon that uh, brought the spacecraft closer and closer to the ISS. The first was a boost burn. Um, this is based on orbital data and um, this raises Dragon's orbit until its orbit reaches an altitude of just 10 kilometers lower than the space station. It was followed soon after by a close co-elliptic burn uh, to place, uh, that placed Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station, which means that the crew was about 10 kilometers lower than the station during the entire orbit uh, around the Earth. The third maneuver is the transfer burn, where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or the highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers below the station. And then we rounded everything out with a final co-elliptic burn to once again maintain a constant orbit beneath the station, this time just 2.5 kilometers below it. That's where we picked up to get into the approach initiation phase and the final stages of Dragon's rendezvous with the space station. This was also when uh, integrated operations between the Dragon control team located here in Hawthorne and the space station flight controllers in Mission Control Houston uh, started. The teams transitioned to integrated operations about 45 minutes uh, right before approach initiation. Yeah, that's really where we began um, our, our broadcast just over two hours ago. During the approach, SpaceX flight controllers worked in tandem with NASA teams in Houston to activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including the bi-directional communications that Dan mentioned earlier uh, with the station using the C2V2 system, which stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles. Um, this also sets up data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. We we'll also maneuver Dragon to the proper attitude or orientation and initialize the navigation sensors used for the methodical approach to the station. And a little bit of time ago, the Draco thrusters on Dragon fired for the approach initiation burn when uh, the Dragon was about two and a half kilometers below the station and just about seven kilometers behind it. 
That swung Dragon up until it was about 400 meters directly below the station. And that maneuver also moved Dragon inside one of the two safety zones that Dan mentioned earlier around the station that required a set of go or no go poles with the different control teams. Yeah, the first um, zone is called the approach ellipsoid. It's an, uh, essentially an imaginary um, uh, shape measuring four kilometers by um, two kilometers by two kilometers, essentially a large three-dimensional oval around the International Space Station. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside this ellipsoid, uh, referred to the teams as the AE, it's configured to be what is known as um, a 24-hour safe trajectory. And now what this means is that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of all of its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its orbital path would take it inside of the approach ellipsoid. So once Dragon uh, arrived at 400 meters below the station, that was where uh, it was the waypoint zero, which was the first checkpoint during Dragon's approach. Uh, the vehicle could hold at 400 meters, uh, but in this instance, uh, continued on as all systems checked out to approach uh, to waypoint one and uh, through it. Yeah, at this point, the teams uh, passed through waypoint one and continued on to waypoint two. This is where we're currently at, so we're inside that keep out sphere, which is again in, in sort of another imaginary sphere around um, the International Space Station, this time um, uh, 200 meters uh, in radius. And um, at waypoint two, we are currently holding to troubleshoot some video issues um, of a dragon. So we have feed um, of Dragon looking at the docking adapter of the International Space Station. The folks here on ground can also see that video, but uh, there is a disconnect between um, the video feed to the International Space Station. So there are um, a couple of paths that we are continuing to look at, um, uh, and hopefully we can update from the team soon and we can proceed with docking. So while we're waiting for some updates, uh, it's worth discussing, discussing excuse me, uh, the mission patch of the AX-1 mission. So at the heart of the patch is the venerable ISS itself, which is the core of this pioneering private research mission, reflects AX-1's role as a precur precursor for future activity in low Earth orbit and a key step toward the, towards the ISS's commercial successor, Axiom Station. The flags of the four countries adorn the ISS in the middle there in the form of its solar arrays. It represents the multinational crew and reinforces the importance of international collaboration and exploration. And in the background, a cascading plane of blue uh, represents Earth's atmosphere and the journey humanity has traveled to arrive in this new era among the first steps in expanding the human presence in low Earth orbit. 
the four bright stars you see kind of at the top there, one for each crew member, and an atom at the center of that constellation represents the expedition's scientific and aspirational goals. The very top, the last name of each crew member, Commander Michael Lopez Alegria of the USA and Spain, Pilot Larry Connor of the USA, Mission Specialist Mark Pathy of Canada, and Mission Specialist Eitan Stiba of Israel ador adorn the top of the design. The bottom highlights the Earth overflown while the mission's historic significance is spelled out in the first private crew to the ISS. The golden border around the edge of the patch is inspired by the logo of Rakia, the mission's name in Stiba's home country, which marks the significance of this mission to the people of Israel as it's really their return to flight uh, in honor of their first Israeli astronaut, Elon Ramon. So, you know, Andy, it's certainly a patch filled with a lot of significance and a lot of meaning to the crew. Yeah, this is definitely one of my favorite patches. I especially love the uh, atom symbol in the middle, representing all this cool science that the team is going to do. Um, uh, earlier in the launch webcast, we saw inside the capsule, uh, there are the patches of Demo 2 and Crew 2, which this capsule um, uh, has flown before. And so uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this, this patch will also join the other two patches inside the capsule of the Dragon. Absolutely. And if you're hearing some noise in the background of our uh, broadcast, it's worth mentioning that we are in a rocket factory here at uh, SpaceX Hawthorne. So there's still a lot of activity going on even early in the morning um, on Saturday. Yeah, um, things really don't stop around here at SpaceX. So it is uh, just after 5 a.m. on a Saturday, but um, production is starting to pick up again. Um, and that's really just par for the course here for us at SpaceX. Absolutely. I mean, it's certainly going to be a busy time for SpaceX uh, with, you know, the launches that are upcoming in the next couple weeks. Um, so talking a little bit more on the uh, members of the AX-1 crew. Um, so our mission commander is Michael Lopez Alegria, who is a decorated um, former NASA astronaut. He calls, uh, he was born in Madrid, Spain, and has also called Mission Viejo, California, as well as Boston, Massachusetts home. He is a U.S. Navy captain and has flown three times aboard the space shuttle and once aboard Soyuz, so he's certainly no stranger to low Earth orbit life. And he has conducted 10 spacewalks in his career, which means, you know, extravehicular activity outside of the ISS, and that's accumulated into 67 hours and 40 minutes in the vacuum of space, both of which are NASA records. Um, and in 2021, he was inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. And uh, sitting next to MLA is the pilot for AX-1, uh, Larry Connor from Dayton, Ohio. Larry is an entrepreneur and a nonprofit activist investor. He has won aerobatic flying competitions and summited both Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Rainier. Through, Ac through AX-1, he will become the first private pilot to reach the International Space Station. He will also become the first human to reach both the deepest ocean depths and enter the bounds of outer space within one year. Larry has been actively involved with the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic for many, many years, helping to understand the effects of aging. And this mission will add a new dimension of several, new dimension to several of these studies. And can I just say the deepest depths of space and then all the way to low Earth orbit? I mean, that is, that is wild. I can't even imagine wow. that. Uh, and then our mission specialist one, Eitan Stiva, is now the second Israeli ever to fly to space. Eitan served for more than four decades as a fighter pilot in the Israeli Air Force, where he received the Distinguished Aviator Medal. And today, he is an impact investor and philanthropist. I mentioned earlier what a special mission this is for Eitan and the country of Israel. Uh, he's uh, working under the banner of the Rakia uh, mission, um, which uh, has the maxim, there is no dream beyond reach. Uh, during his time on the ISS, he'll facilitate several scientific, exper uh, scientific experiments, educational outreach, as well as artistic activities. And rounding out our crew, Mark Pathy is an entrepreneur, investor, and philanthropist, as well as the mission specialist, too, on this AX-1 mission. Pathy is currently the chief executive officer and chairman of Montreal-based Maverick, a privately owned investment and financing company he founded that focuses on innovation and social impact. As 
a strong believer in the importance of philanthropy. Kathy is a member of the boards and executive committees of the Montreal Children's Hospital Foundation, Don LaRue, and the Pathy Family Foundation. Through the AX1 mission, Pathy has become Canada's second private astronaut and the 12th Canadian to go into space. So yeah, that was our four crew members. And again, they are um, inside of our Dragon capsule Endeavour, just parked about 20 meters away from the International Space Station. Uh, again, waiting on um, some uh, video troubleshooting um, uh, that the teams here on the ground are currently working through. Um, if you are just joining us, this is uh, a live um, uh, mission uh, for the AX-1 mission, and the crew is uh, was moments away from docking with the International Space Station, so we ran into a little bit of a hiccup, but again, we have some uh, primary and backup plans um, that we're working through to hopefully get that video feed to the International Space Station and resume docking operations. And we've, you know, throughout this whole process, we've really heard uh, uh, mission control here at SpaceX, uh, as well as mission control over in Houston, really in lockstep with each other in integrated operations. It really highlights how much of a collaborative effort um, things like this are. You know, there's a uh, saying in the industry that space is hard, and rightfully so. It's very complex to put a human into space safely. You know, the safety of the crew, um, you know, both in the Dragon capsule and and also on the ISS is paramount, um, and it's you know always the number one focus. So everyone, you, you really want to make sure that each step that you take, you're confirmed that everything is um, you know good to go. Yeah, and, and that's why as part of the procedures, we we have these holds built into the operations and and to, to verify all of the checks. Um, in this particular uh, moment. Um, uh, confirming that that video feed on the International Space Station side uh, is part of the flight operation. So again, the team is going through and doing their due diligence to make sure that uh, everything is set up and safe for uh, the Dragon capsule to um, go ahead and dock with the International Space Station. Absolutely. And in preparation for, you know, troubleshooting moments like this or, you know, just generally uh, life aboard the ISS or, you know, going through launches like this, um, the crew members also have to go through several hours of training. I mean, like, they went through 700 to 1,000 hours of training starting in August of 2021. Um, so, you know, it was a lot of investment of time and resources that they've put into um, preparing for this mission. I mean, they really went above and beyond. Yeah, the International Space Station and the Dragon capsule are uh, have just passed over Peru. Um, again, continuing to circle the Earth. We are in an orbital um, daytime, um, but again, we are still holding at waypoint zero or waypoint um, two, uh, about 20 meters away from um, the docking adapter. So Andy, there's no doubt that the incredible efforts of thousands of folks across NASA over the last two decades have set the stage for you know what is possible in low Earth orbit. The AX-1 mission is a critical step towards opening these possibilities to a host of new participants, you know, governments, diverse researchers, manufacturers, and more people. Um, here on Earth, we're already seeing benefits from research currently conducted on the ISS from water and air purification systems to testing medical devices as well as therapeutics. In addition to tech demos uh, and medical research, access to low Earth orbit allows for a connection to the arts and other outreach opportunities. AX-1 is the first of several proposed missions in the advance of uh, Axiom Station, the world's first commercial space station. A sustainable commercial low Earth orbit economy means that um, expanded access to work in space is um, available. It also uh, frees up NASA and its partners to put their budget towards other exploration programs while granting space agencies around the world more opportunities through commercial efforts. Absolutely. You know, and over its lifetime, the ISS has accomplished an unprecedented feat. It's continuously sustained operations on and off the Earth for more than 20 years, which is not only a true testament to the technology required to physically achieve that, 
but also to the collaborative and cooperative efforts of thousands of people across the world to ensure that multiple nations, agencies, and entities, both public and private, work together to push humanity forward. And you know, as we move forward, private industries like Axiom Space need, to, need time to learn how to establish and maintain those relationships effectively. So by flying our private astronaut missions like AX-1 uh, to the ISS, Axiom is taking essential steps to get that on-the-job training as we work towards building the fir world's first commercial space station. Axiom Station is an opportunity to continue the story of the ISS. Science and research through cooperation and collaboration on a global scale for the benefit of all. So, you know, AX1 is really uh, the next chapter. Yeah. Uh, for now, um, as we continue to wait for updates um, of the video troubleshooting issue, we are going to check in with Dan uh, over at JSC in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy and Tricia. And so just current status, we're still hanging out at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters away. We are coming up on our next troubleshooting steps, though. So uh, the issue we ran into a little bit earlier is getting what's known as the center line camera. So that's that camera view directly uh, right down the middle of essentially the docking hatch of Dragon pointing at the docking port on station. And one of our flight rules requires that video to be visible on board the space station for the crew monitoring Dragon during its final approach after we proceed in from waypoint two. So the teams have gone through a couple of steps to try and troubleshoot th that to get the video up to the crew. Uh, we have coming up in just a couple of minutes a ground pass. Um, so a couple of things are going to happen over the next few minutes. First, we're going to get uh, our KU coverage back with the space station in about a minute, minute and a half. So we'll get views back from the space station. We'll also get that high rate data link uh, where we can essentially also send video signals up to the station crew. At about 723 central, so in about two minutes, uh, Dragon's going to be doing a pass over a SpaceX ground site, which offers another path to get video from Dragon down to the ground. So the teams are going to take that video, ingest it, bring it over here to Mission Control Houston, send it back up to the station crew through another route to hopefully get it into their station support Houston computer on the big for them to for do status. that monitoring. Go ahead on the big loop. Yeah, Roger, wanted to give you a heads up on our plan here. Any moment now, we are expecting KU to come back at this point. We're going to route some camera views. Um, so that we can see uh, Dragon better from the ground here. At 12.23, so about one minute from now, we are expecting to get a video feed from SpaceX that will just come to MCC Houston over here. That's going to last about five minutes. Our plan is we are going to check the alignment, make sure that Dragon is in good position. As long as those checks work, we are going to press ahead uh, with the docking attempt. How copy so far? Okay, copy about 1223. You guys will get video to MCC for about five minutes. You guys are going to check the alignment on the ground, and if you're happy, you'll uh, land the press ahead. And that's a good copy, Raja, and we will let you know when we're pressing in. Stand by. Dragon to ground. Giving the I'm update. sure you copied all on the big loop. Uh, stand by. Uh, we're zipping up a plan here, uh, and I'll let you know before we command resume. And so again, right now we're standing by for Dragon to make that pass over a SpaceX ground site. The plan. We've now got some additional cameras trained on Dragon, just giving the team's additional alignment insight into the capsule as it still hangs out 20 meters away from the docking port. We're just beginning a pass over station ground sites now, and teams are gonna work to get that video up to the crew. This ground site pass will last for about five minutes, and that means the video will likely not be available for the entirety of that final approach. However, Dragon, the way the flight on the rules are written. Confirm crew readiness for final approach. SpaceX 
SpaceX, Endeavor, copy all, we're ready, visors down. And again, as long as the teams Dragon have this SpaceX data now, on the big we're loop, able to confirm imminent. good alignment. Dragon is entering approach two. And Dragon's flight computer getting into approach two. Perhaps uh, we've Denver, gotten that video. We've been able to confirm alignment here on the ground. The NASA flight director and the SpaceX mission director have conferred and confirmed Dragon is in good alignment. We have additional tools available, uh, giving us degrees it's off access. Just it's just real time the telemetry of Dragon at 10, during its approach. Two and one, and we'll be hands off at two meters. Good copy, Dragon. All right, so Dragon is now accelerating in for docking. So again, we were able to get that ground pass video. The teams here in Houston, visiting vehicle officer, other support personnel confirmed Dragon was in good alignment. And that video from the ground site, that's the one you were just seeing on the left. So Dragon's now continuing in towards docking. We've departed waypoint two. We're only 17 and a half meters away. We confirmed good alignment. And we've got additional views now trained on Dragon, giving additional situational awareness. And we're continuing to get those updates from the navigational equipment on board Dragon. The LIDAR's giving real-time range rate. Uh, we're getting real-time degrees, and that's also being fed to the crew in real time. They don't have that video, but they do have all that additional data that's able to give them uh, enough data to make decisions for a board if they need to. So we have proceeded. We are go for docking. Dragon's flying in. It's moving at less than a tenth of a meter per second. We're just about 15 meters away now from the docking port on the space facing side of node two. Should be just under three minutes away from docking. And you can see the soft capture ring on the docking mechanisms extended. It's got three of those slightly triangular looking shapes, and those are the pedals that are going to be used to guide it in to the passive docking me mechanism on the station side. After that makes the initial attachment, that docking ring is going to retract, bring it in, and then it's going to be able to make a hard mate, engaging 12 hooks to give a, the, the hard mate, the hard dock. Um, to the space station. SpaceX copies, 10 meters. So 10 meters again. Once we get to about 6 meters, you're going to hear the crew call out CHOP. That's the crew hands-off point. That's just giving direction to the crew on board Dragon not to make any manual control decisions or movements as everything gets handled by the flight computer from that point in. 8 meters away. Continuing to get confirmation that Dragon is in the correct attitude in the approach corridor. Not tracking any issues, just past seven meters from the docking port. Six meters in closing. The international five docking meters. adapter number three in view Basics on the lower copies, right there. Five meters. Under five meters to go. Still seeing good alignment. Under three meters. Soft docking ring on Dragon on top off. there. International docking adapter Basics on the right. Copies, two meters. Two meters. We heard chop call. The crew hands off point. One meter. One meter to go.
Dragon, SpaceX, and on the big loop, contact soft and soft capture complete, attenuation in progress. SpaceX Endeavor, copy all, good. All right, so with that contact and capture coming at 7.29 a.m. Central Time, 5.29 a.m. Eastern, that's 12.29 UTC, while the station and Dragon flew 258 statute miles over the Central Atlantic Ocean. So with that initial contact made, the soft capture ring is now going to begin to retract. After Dragon, that is SpaceX completed, on the big we'll be able to soft start capture ring hooks. retraction in progress. Big soft capture ring in progress. So we're now going to see Dragon inch a little bit closer to that docking adapter until it essentially performs a sealed connection. And then we'll be able to engage 12 hooks that uh, form the hard capture function onboard Dragon. Six of those are actually engaged during the launch and on the way into orbit, and they hold the nose cone, which you can see opened off to the right there. They hold that in place, uh, and then they're opened up once we're on orbit to deploy the nose cone. Uh, but 12 of those are now going to engage after the soft capture ring has retracted. Once those 12 are engaged, we'll have a hard mate. Then we can start co to connect two umbilicals that are going to uh, provide hard line data and power to Dragon through station systems. And then we'll be able to get the docking complete call. And then it's on to uh, some of the post docking operations. So for the crew inside Dragon, they'll be getting out of their suits, uh, doing some basic cabin configuration as they get ready to open the hatch on their side. Uh, that'll be the last hatch to open. Uh, meanwhile, on the station side, uh, Tom Marshburn and the Expedition 67 crew will start outfitting what's called the A-pass hatch. That's the hatch on the station side. It's got a small valve that Marshburn's going to open up to begin to flow atmosphere to the space between the Dragon and the station hatches. Right now, it's still exposed to vacuum, but as soon as we're able to pull Dragon in and engage those hooks, uh, that will become a sealed uh, sealed space and so we'll be able to pressurize it essentially just flowing atmosphere from the station into that previously vacuum space between the two hatches we'll stop a couple of times on the way up and the pressure uh, just to do leak checks and let thermals equalize to make sure that we're actually measuring pressure and how much atmosphere is in there and not just thermal fluctuations um, and so once we get that up to pretty much the same ambient pressure as the space station will open the A-pass hatch first and then it'll be over to the Dragon crew to open the hatch into Crew Dragon Endeavor. So still waiting for that soft capture ring to retract. Um, this might be a bit of deja vu for Dragon Commander Mike L.A. as this is actually the second time in his spaceflight career that he's docked to the space station on a spacecraft named Endeavor. Uh, he flew on Shuttle Endeavour back on STS-113, flying to the station in November of 2002 to deliver the Expedition 6 crew. So thank you to our resident space flight encyclopedia for that tidbit. So for now, the soft capture ring's still retracting, and once that's completed, uh, we'll be able to begin connecting those hooks and those are going to hold it in place we'll get those umbilicals and then we'll be able to start stepping into hatch operations dragon spacex on the big loop ring retraction complete docking sequence is holding for mcs reconfiguration spacex endeavor copy all And that soft capture ring has retracted. Uh, as you heard, we're going to now stand by for a moment for MCS reconfigure. That's the motion control system on board station. For the docking ops, we were we had handed over to the thrusters on the Russian segment for 
propulsive attitude control. Uh, now that the soft capture is completed, we're going to hand back over uh, to the gyroscopes, the large gyroscopes on the U.S. segment that are just run electronically to provide non-propulsive attitude control to the station. And then once that handover is complete, we'll start engaging those 12 hooks, holding Dragon in place, and then getting closer to that docking complete call. But um, if you're just joining the docking, that initial contact and capture did take place uh, just about five minutes ago at 7.29 a.m. Central, 5.29 a.m. Pacific. Uh, 1229 GMT as uh, both the station and Dragon were flying 258 statute miles over the Atlantic connecting the spacecraft to the station carrying the first all private astronaut mission to station the orbit Houston. lab. MCS is configured proceeding with hook driving. Station copies. And we now have the motion control system on the station reconfigured back in uh, attitude control being done by the U.S. gyroscopes. And they're now going to start engaging those 12 hooks uh, on the Dragon capsule. All right, we've got confirmation that the hooks have started to drive. And so there's 12 total. We're going to do them in two groups of six. Um, so the, the first set of six driving now. Um, in this split screen view, you've got the newly arrived Dragon Endeavor on the left. On the right there is NASA astronaut and current Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn. Uh, he's on the timeline to take the lead in the vestibule pressurization operation, so he's going to be uh, moving into uh, the pressurized mating adapter in the space-facing side of node 2 and working on the station side hatch, opening up a valve to uh, start to flow atmosphere from station into that uh, soon-to-be sealed pressurized area between the two hatches. And again, we expect hatch opening to take place roughly two hours. Uh, should be a little bit less than two hours following a docking. Um, so with that docking happening uh, right around 7.30 Central, um, it'll probably be uh, sometime uh, in the 9 o'clock hour uh, before we get the hatches open. For the crew on board, they're going to remain in their seats throughout this as we continue to drive the hooks. And then once those hooks are driven and docking is complete, we will be able to have them get out of the suits. Uh, that'll be one of the first items for them. Uh, they'll also begin to just reconfigure the cabin. And we just got confirmation six of those hooks are engaged, so the first set is good. And then the second set is now driving. And again, first set of hooks are in place. Second set of six hooks are now driving. And once we get those in place and get uh, the umbilicals deployed, we'll have docking complete. And then the crew will be able to get out of their suits on board of Dragon. Uh, they'll start to reconfigure the cabin. One of the first things that they'll do uh, once we get hatches open is to remove what's called a lyo canister. It's lithium hydroxide. That's the system used on board of Dragon to scrub CO2 from the air. They just remove it and put a seal over it as um, they've got a couple of essentially cartridges that get used while Dragon's in free flight. 
um, and as they're going to be integrating Dragon's atmosphere with the rest of station, uh, they'll take that out and then they'll be able to rely on uh, the station atmospheric revitalization systems, uh, scrubbing CO2, providing oxygen uh, for the duration of their docked visit. Um, once they get on board, and I'll address this a few times, we usually get asked, where's everybody going to sleep? As we now have 11 people uh, on board the space station. Uh, for the AX-1 crew, they're going to be split up in a couple of different areas. One will sleep inside of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one will set up a, a temporary sleep location in the Quest airlock. And then we'll have two spots inside of the European Columbus module. Um, one in the newly fabricated CASA, the, it's essentially a new uh, crew quarters set up there, uh, the roughly closet-sized uh, private booths SpaceX that we have on, the on board the station capture with complete. four uh, over in node two. SpaceX Endeavor, hard capture complete. And there's the call, hard capture is complete. So all 12 hooks engaged and in place. Next up are some umbilicals, but Dragon now firmly attached to the space station. We see the visors come up on the crew inside, and we can start now stepping into some of the operations to get those hatches open and get these AX-1 astronauts on board the station. So with that, I'm gonna send it over to the team in Hawthorne. Andy, Trisha, congratulations on docking the first private astronaut mission to station. Uh, why don't you take us a little bit for the rest of the way? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, right back at you. Um, uh, that was amazing. And so we did dock uh, about an hour later than scheduled, but I always like to think of it as a silver lining. Uh, we were to, able to get an orbital daytime during the dock, so absolutely gorgeous views of Dragon's approach and contact with the International Space Station. And uh, as Dan had mentioned and, and we heard over the nets, uh, hard capture is complete. We are waiting for umbilicals to be plugged in and installed, um, but Dragon is now firmly secured to the International Space Station, so um, docking procedures can uh, continue um, and eventually the crew will make their way out of Dragon and onto the International Space Station. Yeah, I mean, oh my gosh, it's just incredibly exciting to watch that. I mean, watching the whole process of Dragon approaching uh, the <clears throat> docking adapter and then, you know, completing that dock was just, I mean, personally for me, I was very, very excited. So I can only imagine what the crew is feeling like right now. This is, you know, like setting off the rest of the uh, eight days that they're gonna have on orbit. So just an incredibly exciting time and very special for everyone involved. Yeah, and, and absolutely an incredible effort from the teams to um, troubleshoot that issue and get things going. Um, that is really what uh, the joint operations and, and, uh, and space is about. Uh, you had mentioned it earlier, space is not easy, <laughs> um, but you know, it takes a lot of very dedicated, a talented, smart, uh, 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 hardworking folks uh, to make sure these things are done safely. So, um, yeah, with uh, the crew uh, now one step closer to um, uh, getting on board the International Space Station and starting all of the cool science that, uh, you know, I'm sure they're excited to do. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, docking sequence complete. I hope you enjoyed the extra half orbit in Dragon or at least found it memorable. Crew Dragon Endeavor and MLA, welcome back. Aton Larry Mark, welcome to the International Space Station. SpaceX Endeavor, we copy all. We're happy to be here, even though we're a bit uh, late and looking forward to the uh, next chapter. Thanks for all the great work. On behalf of SpaceX, it's been a pleasure working with you. At this time, ground will be enabling power and comm connections. You are go to DOF suits per procedure 4.012. We'll bring the cameras external shortly. Thanks, Jake. We're moving to 4.012. An endeavor from MCCH. Welcome to the International Space Station. We are looking forward 
to uh, this historic mission. MCCH Endeavor, thanks for all the great work. We're looking forward to uh, moving uh, into the ISS with the uh, other crews. We're looking forward to it, Endeavor. Welcome aboard. So uh, some final exchanges as uh, the crew on board Capsule Endeavor begin to doff or take off their spacesuits. Uh, in the past, they've actually just left. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No response required. Cameras are external. In the past, uh, I think uh, what we've seen is the, the suits are just kind of left in the seats, strapped in, and, and they're stored in the Dragon. Um, but it is uh, quite a, a uh, funny scene to see the astronauts kind of floating around, gathering their belongings, and there's like these four mannequins <laughs> sitting in the seats. Uh, but they're getting ready. Um, they're, um, uh, there are a couple more operations that needs to happen before we can open both of the hatches. So um, as Dan was mentioning, the A-pass hatch on the International Space Station side um, will open first. Um, prior to that, we're going to fill the vestibule, which is the space between the two hatches. We're going to fill that with um, air and pressure uh, to make sure that um, it is equalized on both sides. Then we'll open the A-pass hatch. Then the Dragon hatch will open, and then uh, the crews can meet. Station Houston for Tom on the big loop. Houston on the big loop. Yes, sir. Better late than never, but we can now give you a go to get into uh, ingress part one. And specifically, you have a go through one decimal one and two decimal two. Copy. One decimal one and two decimal one. I have a go for the part one of the hatch opening. Copy that. Also, you have a go in two decimal two when you get there. Copy and a go in two decimal two. So again, beginning the initial steps for hatch open uh, on both sides. Uh, so. Uh, with that, you know, it's been, outside of the, the small hiccup with video, smooth ride up um, uh, to the International Space Station. Absolutely. The crew has certainly been on a long journey starting bright and early yesterday, April 8th, for, uh, you know, when they arrived to uh, launch pad 39A, leading all the way up to launch at 8.17 a.m. Eastern and 11.17 a.m. Pacific on April 8th. And now, you know, just having completed uh, the docking sequence and now they're beginning hatch operations it's just very exciting to see um the whole journey that they've been through yeah the crew has been uh, in space and in dragon for almost a day actually um we're we're coming up on 23 or 24 hours in inside the capsule um on board they were able to eat a couple of meals um they had a sleep and rest period they we we did an onboard uh, live event earlier uh, this morning um, so I'm sure the crew is super excited to, uh, you know, take off those spacesuits and uh, get uh, head their way uh, into the International Space Station. And this here is a great view of Dragon. It is docked at the uh, Zenith port. SpaceX and on Dragon ground. Cabin check. Sorry, cabin mic check. Dragon, SpaceX on the cabin mic. We have you five by five. Glad to hear you loud and clear again. Lots of exciting things happening. Uh, with that, yeah, let's... same here. Do you want me to do another comp big loop? At this point, I'm expecting it's a suit issue. Uh, that's not gospel, but um, I, we're, I think we're good. Uh, oh, I understand. Yeah, com mic com check on the big loop would be good. Cabin mic on the big loop. It's 
Endeavour on the big loop. Kevin Mike check. Endeavour SpaceX on the big loop. Kevin Mike check five by five. Copy all. Thanks, Jake. Uh, so we are going through some checks. This is a view of Dragon docked at the Zenith or space-facing uh, space port. Uh, so uh, the uh, hatch is actually pointing down towards Earth, um, and the crew is inside, again, doffing their spacesuits or taking off their spacesuits, getting ready to enter the uh, International Space Station here shortly. Uh, for now, we're going to send it back over to Dan at, jo at Johnson Space Center in Houston. Hey, thanks, Andy. Yeah, we are now docked and ready to get into hatch ops. So uh, pretty soon we're going to start flowing air through a small valve uh, in the station's A-pass hatch. That's just the hatch on the station side uh, into what's known as the vestibule. That's just that small space that before docking is just exposed to vacuum. Uh, but now with Dragon firmly attached, we've got a tight seal uh, and we're going to start uh, pressurizing that section. So we're going to do it uh, in a couple of steps. Um, Station Commander Tom Marshburn is going to be primed for this. Um, and first thing uh, is he's right now in Node 2 uh, in the Harmony module, and here's a live view. Uh, first, he's working to open up um, what's known as the uh, PMA hatch, so the hatch into the pressurized mating adapter. This is closed during the docking operations. And with that, Tom Marshburn has that PMA hatch open. So you can see now inside the pressurized mating adapter, uh, we do use it for storage um, as space is limited on board the station. So number of items stored, but you can see the cover uh, to the A-pass hatch now uh, in view. So Marshburn is going to go there. He's going to open a small valve. It's going to start flowing uh, atmosphere from the station into the vestibule. And we're going to slowly pressurize that. Uh, we're going to use sensors on the Dragon hatch to measure temperature and uh, pressure inside of the vestibule as that happens. So station on the big loop, no two overhead hatches. And so right open. now he's going to... Copy. Hatch open. Thanks, Tom. And so Marshburn just radioing down the, the overhead hatch so the hatch into the, the pressurized mating adapter is open. He's grabbed a tablet with his procedures on and he's going to now start stepping through uh, the vestibule pressurization. So he's going to open a small equalization valve um, and that's going to start flowing air uh, from station into that vestibule. Um, we're going to give it some time uh, for those hatch seals inside to relax. Um, is we're going to be introducing a pretty substantial thermal change for them. Um, so again, as we're as we're measuring pressure inside, we want to ensure that that's not just the air heating up, but we're getting a, a, an accurate reading of how much atmosphere is now in that vestibule. And we're going to continue this pressurization until you essentially equalize the pressure between uh, the vestibule and the station and Dragon. They're all going to be at a very similar pressure. We can wait for pressures to equalize um, so we can uh, just kind of pause and wait uh, but at this point the vestibule pressurization has started it sounds like uh, we're getting that valve open um, and so we're going to start stepping through so this all told um, will take about 10 minutes to start the the pressurization uh, and then after that we're going to do a leak check that can Go anywhere from 15 minutes up. Oh, quick view of Raja Chari, who was doing our primary dragon monitoring there. Uh, but after we get the vestibule pressurized, we'll, we'll go into a leak check uh, where they just, again, they wait for thermal conditions to stabilize. They're able to uh, do a leak check and then ensure that the vestibule is pressure tight.
Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground. No response required. ISS crew are stepping into vestibule pressurization imminently. You are free to follow along with telemetry in 4.400, Section 4, if you'd like. Houston Station on the Big Loop. Eight pass equalization valve is open for 75 seconds. Now closed at the GMT 1255. Twelve five five copy. We will take care of the leak check from the ground and give you a heads up here in just a little bit. Copy. And so as we just heard the Dragon crew get told, the vestibule pressurization is beginning. So again, that's done on the station side. Again, this is Mission Control Houston, so Dragon currently docked to the International Space Station. They linked up with the space-facing port on No-2, the Harmony module, uh, just about 30 minutes ago, docking at 7.29 a.m. Central, uh, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, while the station and Dragon were flying just 258 statute miles over the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we did hang out at Waypoint 2 just about 20 minutes away. Uh, while we were troubleshooting, uh, while we were troubleshooting uh, a video issue, getting it over to the the station crew for monitoring, but we were able to effect a workaround. Teams on the ground confirming that Dragon was in uh, the proper alignment, proper attitude, and then the capsule was able to get the go for final approach, and then link up. So, with the docking complete, Dragon firmly attached, we're into hatch up. So. Tom Marshburn has started.
the pressurization of the vestibule, that space between the two hatches. And we're going to continue that and then execute a leak check, which can take anywhere from 15 minutes up to an hour, just depending on uh, what kind of readings we start getting back. We're going to be using sensors on the Dragon hatch for tracking pressure, temperature, everything uh, inside that vestibule. Meanwhile, the crew on board Dragon is able to now get out of their suits that they were wearing for that dynamic phase of rendezvous and docking. And then once uh, they're out of there, they can monitor the hatch ops from their side. And then once everything is done uh, with the station crew getting the vestibule pressurized, they'll open up the station side hatch first. And then it'll be over to the AX-1 crew to open the hatch on Dragon. And then after we get the hatches open, the... Expedition 67 crew will be able to welcome them on board and we will have a welcome ceremony um, sometime after hatch open. Uh, could take as long as 30 minutes as there are a couple of steps they have to uh, take just after we get the hatches open just to get Dragon configured for docked operations, including taking some steps just to start integrating Dragon's cabin atmosphere with that on board the space station. Uh, and then we'll get the entire Expedition 67 crew, all seven of them, uh, along with the recently arrived AX-1 astronauts all together and have a special ceremony to welcome the first private astronaut mission to the space station. We docked about 45 minutes behind schedule uh, per the original timeline, so we are expecting uh, pretty much everything else to shift with that. Um, but we'll continue to give you updates as we get through hatch operations and get ready to bring the crew on board. Station Endeavour, Houston, on the big loop for Timeline Sync. Endeavour's ready to copy. Yes, Station, and Endeavour wanted to give everyone a heads up the way uh, the rest of the day is going to look here with uh, docking occurring 45 minutes late. The intention here is the PAO event and the subsequent safety briefing will slide to the right by 45 minutes, um, which will carry over to the rest of the day. However, we'll let you guys flex and manage. Um, if you're able to make up some time, we are good with that. Otherwise, uh, we'll hang in with you um, as the timeline would be extended a little bit. I'll copy. Copies off. 
Copy, and thanks for the flexibility. Roger, up on those calls. We are not hearing them. And copy that, LA. We talked to Station on uh, Space to Ground 3 earlier, so they are aware, so we're good and in sync. So thanks for the heads up. Okay, you got it. And LA, we've got you loud and clear, and we're following along on Space to Ground 2. Big loop. And we just heard an update called up to the crew from the Capcom Scott's Gaty here in Houston. Uh, as mentioned, docking did take place about 45 minutes after the initially intended time, uh, as we did spend extra time at Waypoint 2, just 20 meters away from station, to troubleshoot a video issue, just getting video um, up to the station crew. Uh, we were able to come up with a workaround, teams on the ground, able to confirm Dragon attitude positioning uh, all within normal bounds. And they did that final approach and that docking happening at 7.29 a.m. Uh, Central, uh, 5.29 a.m. Pacific, uh, that's 12.29 GMT. And that happened while both the station uh, and Dragon were flying just over the central part of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, since then, we're already now into hatch operations. Um, so the vestibule pressurization is underway. Uh, a small uh, relief valve has been opened uh, on the station side to flow atmosphere into that space between the Dragon and station hatches. Uh, we're using sensors on the Dragon hatch to measure uh, that pressurization. Uh, and then we're going to, after it gets up to about ambient pressure with the rest of the station, we're going to pause uh, and we're going to let thermal stabilize and then conduct a leak check just to make sure that we've got a tight seal between the Dragon and the station uh, before we start opening up the hatches. We're going to open the hatch on the station side first. It's called the A-pass hatch. Um, so the station crew will get that open, and then once we, again, confirm pressures are roughly equalized between station Dragon, and Dragon, station, uh, the Dragon on crew the will open up Power their hatch. connection to Dragon established. They just called up that a, that the power connection to Dragon has been established. So two umbilicals uh, have now been extended and connected between the Dragon spacecraft and the space station. That allows them to have a hard line integration into station power and data. Uh, now Dragon using the station systems uh, to power. Uh, its own uh, its own hardware inside, um, not relying on those solar arrays or any batteries at this point, able to draw power from the station. Uh, Dragon is largely left in a power down mode um, after the crew gets uh, on board. A lot of its systems are put into kind of a quiescent mode while docked, uh, with the SpaceX teams routinely bringing them up um, during the docked mission just to do checkouts. Uh, but for now, they are... Um, hooked in to station power, to station data, um, and then once we get the hatches open, they'll uh, take some steps to integrate the cabin atmosphere in Dragon with that on board the space station, able to rely on the regenerative uh, capabilities of the space station, and then preser preserving uh, the consumables on board Dragon, both the, the breathable oxygen and nitrogen, and also the carbon dioxide scrubbing. Um, so those will get essentially taken out of their configs and will get brought back up online when it's time for Dragon to depart. And so at this point, the vestibule has been pressurized. 
And we're now going to start stepping through those leak checks. Those can take uh, soon as, as short as about 15 minutes up to an hour. It just depends on how long it takes uh, to reach a thermal equilibrium and also just uh, to make sure that we have steady pressure readings. Again, using sensors on the Dragon Hatch to actually perform this leak check. Then after we confirm a good leak check, we'll be able to get the go up to the station crew to open up the hatch on their side. Uh, and then it'll be over to the SpaceX team. We, there's usually about 30 minutes um, between those two hatches being opened. Uh, the A-Pass coming first, uh, followed shortly after uh, by the Dragon Hatch. But things look quiet right now. The crew actually getting some time, uh, the crew on board station, uh, getting some time right now for their midday meal uh, before they get ready to get the hatch open and welcome the AX-1 astronauts on board. Uh, right after we get everyone on, we'll have the entire Expedition 67 crew join with the AX-1 uh, astronauts and do a formal welcome ceremony, welcoming uh, the first fully private astronaut mission on board the space station. Following that, there's uh, still a pretty busy day for the rest of the afternoon. Um, the station commander, Tom Marshburn, will take the entire station crew, um, so all of our new astronauts as well as the Expedition 67 ones, and doing a safety briefing. This is routine for any crew members arriving at the space station, whether they're professional astronauts or uh, on these new private astronaut missions. Um, Marshburn, as the commander, has overall safety authority for the crew during the expedition on board, and he'll just go through essentially an orientation session, um, showing where all of the critical safety equipment is located, going over paths toward to safe haven, back to vehicles, hatch closings, uh, things of that nature. Um, just giving a safety briefing lasts typically about an hour um, before the crew will then go through the rest of their day. Um, Station Commander Marshburn is going to be uh, taking about an hour and a half to do what's known as crew handover with all the newly arrived astronauts, uh, essentially just giving them a tour of the facilities on board, uh, showing them where they're going to be setting up for the duration, uh, just starting to get them acquainted uh, with their home for uh, more than the next week um, while they're on board. Um, I mentioned it earlier, but we do usually get asked pretty frequently, where's everyone going to sleep? as we do not have 11 crew quarters on board, but we have 11 crew members on the space station now. Um, so for our recently arrived AX-1 crew, uh, one of them is going to sleep inside of Crew Dragon Endeavor. Uh, one of them is going to be over in the Quest airlock, um, where we uh, stage spacewalks out of. Uh, we're not doing any spacewalks during this mission or anytime soon, no planned spacewalks. Um, so one crew member will set up in there, and then two will be in the Columbus module, one in uh, the, the newly installed CASA, the crew quarters um, that's over in Columbus, and then another one just setting up what we typically refer to as a campout configuration um, also in Columbus. So they'll be spread out throughout the station um, for their time on board. So again, right now, uh, the vestibule has been pressurized. We're going through the leak checks. Uh, that view on the right, uh, a view up towards the docking port. Um, you're looking at the A-pass or the station hatch side. And the Houston uh, station on proof of private family conference. Through. And again, pretty soon after we get through uh, this leak check, the crew on board will get the go to begin opening that hatch. We'll get the station side open first, followed shortly thereafter uh, by the hatch on board Dragon. And then we'll be able to get the AX-1 crew inside and go through a welcome ceremony to welcome these uh, first private astronaut mission crew members on board the station. We'll have a couple of participants here on the ground able to talk to the crew and then their uh, commander Mike LA will go through a short ceremony and then it'll be off and running for the AX-1 mission. They've already got uh, a number of activities both just kind of getting themselves set up uh, but already stepping into some of their science their outreach activities immediately uh, on this day today. Uh, the entire crew so everybody on board 
uh, is scheduled to go to sleep at uh, a little bit later than the normal time, uh, about 4.30 central here in Houston. Uh, we do keep all of the crew on essentially the same sleep schedule whenever possible, um, just so you don't have, obviously, people moving around and turning lights on while you're trying to sleep in low Earth orbit. Um, they typically follow a schedule uh, for us here in the U.S. where they're waking up uh, in the middle of the night for us. Uh, in fact, their wake-up time tomorrow will be about 1 a.m. here in Houston, and then they immediately get into a lot of their operations. Since tomorrow is Sunday, um, for most of the Expedition 67 crew, uh, it's going to be a relatively light day. As the weekends are typically an off day for them. They'll have some cleaning tasks, which get scheduled on the weekend. Um, each of the crew members spending about two hours exercising, even on their off days, and that's just to help uh, combat the negative effects on the human body of that extended period of time in microgravity, uh, but largely for the Expedition 67 crew, a day off. But for the AX-1, they have a pack schedule tomorrow. Um, one additional activity that will involve the entire crew, so all 11 uh, individuals on board the station, will be just another um, emergency role and response review. So again, just going over um, what each of the crew members has to do in the event of a contingency. We plan for these, we train for these. Everybody that flies to the space station has to go through that training on the ground. And then they're just getting a refresher now that they're up on board around the real hardware, around the real settings uh, that they would have to make that response. So for right now, we're just continuing to follow. Again, they're doing uh, leak checks right now on the vestibule. That's that space between the two hatches, uh, the hatch on station and the hatch on Dragon. We've pressurized it, uh, opening up the valve and uh, introducing atmosphere from the station into that small space. And so we'll hold here for a while, wait for uh, essentially the leak rate to, to bottom out, make sure we have a tight seal uh, before we can get ready to open up the hatch on the station side first, followed soon after by the hatch on Dragon. And this is Mission Control Houston. So we are still waiting for uh, vestibule leak checks to be completed. Again, it has been pressurized, that small space between the space station and the Dragon. And those leak checks taking anywhere from 15 minutes all the way up to an hour. Um, as was radioed up to the crew, we were about 45 minutes late with docking uh, after doing that video troubleshooting, hanging out at waypoint two. 
Uh, we were originally Station planning on getting on the, the hatch list. open. FYI, we're going to reconfigure for hardline comm. It will take down comm to drag in for about two minutes, and we'll give you a call when it comes back. And the Dragon crew getting a heads up. So as mentioned, Dragon now has hardline connections for both power and data to the space station. So they're now going to configure communications to follow through those paths using station systems to come back down to the ground. Uh, Dragon uses the same, while in free flight, the same tracking and data relay satellites as the station. Uh, but just so we're not... Uh, sending an additional wireless signal or at, at a minimum just taking advantage of the station systems, uh, they're going to be switching over to the hardline communications. So while that happens, we're still continuing with the vestibule leak checks. Uh, they have to take some time to, to make sure that uh, the temperature swings steady out inside the vestibule just to ensure that the pressure that we're reading uh, is not caused by any thermal variance, just uh, based off of the actual amount of atmosphere that we float in. And so while we wait for that to continue, uh, the crew on board the station has got some time to go through their midday meal. And meanwhile, the astronauts on board Dragon have given uh, have been given the go to get out of their spacesuits. They, they wore those throughout all of the approach and docking procedures and they're gonna wear those for all of the different dynamic phases of the flight. So they were in them for launch, they were in them for docking, they're gonna be in them for undocking, and then eventually when they come home on the entry, descent, and landing. But as mentioned, we ended up docking about 45 minutes later than originally intended. Um, so pretty much our entire schedule now shifting about 45 minutes later. We'd originally intended to get the hatches open uh, at the bottom of the hour this hour at about 8.30 central. Uh, now looking at getting those hatches open at about 9.15 or so, uh, just depending on how quickly we're able to get through these leak checks and then start to get the hatches open. First the one on station side and then the one over on Dragon. Um, and so we'll be looking at about the 9 o'clock hour uh, for the hatches to get open and after which the AX-1 Astronauts will make their way on board and we'll do a formal welcome ceremony with them and the entirety of the Expedition 67 crew. So while we wait for the vestibule leak checks to be completed, taking us one step closer to hatch open, Send it back over to Andy and Tricia to tell us a little bit more about this mission, which now attached to the space station. Can't wait to see them on board. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to Ground for cabin configuration update. Go ahead, Jake. Hey, Mike. The ISS crew is inching towards a hatch open state. Wanted to check in that the Dragon crew is working towards that as well. We're working toward it, but we aren't going to be dressed for dinner. Copy all, Mike. That was perfectly vague, and I will uh, leave it to you to configure the cabin. While we're talking about that, in 4.400 Section 3, let me know when you're ready. Hey, I am ready for inventory. Go ahead. We haven't touched uh, any food since we last spoke. Um, as far as water, we've taken that same bag uh, out of Location 9 and are continuing to drink bottles from it. Stand by one. have been consumed. Uh, just a question on that. Uh, what? How do you want to account for that? Uh, do you want us to just finish all the bottles that we open and then put it back uh, in, put them back in the bag? 
Hey, Mike, yeah, I think that's going to be the cleanest way to do it. Um, if you could finish any of the half-consumed bottles. Um, and to be clear, these were coming from bag number what? Up y'all, six consumed from bag two zero four. That's affirmed. And then as far as the um, trash that is described in three dot two, we are just going to hand over the uh, duffel from location twenty one to the ISS crew, and that will have all of our waste in it, both uh, trash and uh, the the um, comfort garments that we're wearing now. Okay, copy all, Mike. That sounds right. I'll get back to you if uh, we discover that to not be the correct way forward, uh, but good plan. Okay, thank you. Station Houston on the big loop for Tom. on the big loop for Tom. Yeah, Tom, good news. We have passed the leak check, so at this point we can give you a go for your ingress part two activities. Uh, you have a go in step three, decimal one. A go in step three, decimal one of the opening part two. Thank you. Good copy. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, too. So to summarize, we heard a lot of communication back and forth. So this first set of um, communications was between the core, uh, Jake Vendo. Um, core stands for Crew, Crew Operation Resources Engineer, uh, and folks uh, on board the capsule yeah, endeavor. Um, so the core's job is to communicate with folks inside the Dragon capsule. And the second half of that communication uh, was uh, from between the CAPCOM, which stands for uh, Capsule Communicator, uh, to folks at the ISS. So I'm um, speaking to uh, Tom Marshburn. And so um, we'll continue to hear that as we proceed towards uh, hatch opening and uh, you know eventually the crews meeting each other and going through the welcome ceremony. But we did get confirmation that uh, we did uh, pass the vestibule leak check. And so um, on the APAS, uh, on the International Space Station side, uh, things are continuing to progress, and it looks also sounds like the Ax Axiom One crew um, is working towards, um, you know, uh, getting uh, the Dragon Hatch open as well. Yeah, good news there all the way around. Uh, something interesting to note is uh, their conversation or their back and forth on tracking things like stowage and consumables. You heard their conversation on how to track the water or the uh, beverages that they were consuming and how best to manage that. That actually um, you know, speaks to a big part of life in low Earth orbit. Tracking these kinds of things um, like you know, uh, beverage packets, where exactly they're stored, how they're stored are all uh, extremely important in terms of um, you know management of life in low Earth orbit. They have to know these things uh, so that they know you know how much uh, what they need to send up on resupply missions, how much trash they generate because that's you know trash management is a pretty big issue uh, on orbit. Um, and you know it's all part of a coordinated dance between all teams to uh, keep life smooth uh, while in orbit. Yeah, um, certainly space um, in the ISS uh, or space in low Earth orbit in general um, is is very uh, it is a very important resource. So you can even see on screen right now we're looking at um, uh, Kayla and. Uh, I believe that's Thomas Marshburn uh, working towards opening the A-pass hatch. But um, you can see behind them in that corridor, there's tons of um, storage there. So really... Station Endeavor, Houston, on the big loop. We have configured for hardline comm. Uh, when you have a moment, we'd appreciate comm checks on the big loop. Has you loud and clear on the big loop. Okay, 
So as I was saying, there's uh, here's an even better view of all of the storage that uh, is being put in that Station corridor. Right We're on the big loop for comm check. Endeavour, station has you loud and clear. And Houston Endeavour, on the big loop for comm check. We have you loud and clear as well, LA. Good contracts all around. Appreciate the help, guys. SpaceX Endeavour on dragging the ground for water. SpaceX ready to copy on dragging the ground. Hey, Jake. Uh, looking ahead in 4.400 now in Section 5, we need a. Uh, bottle of water to flush the toilet, so you can take that out of bag 203. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. I think those calls have been coming in on the big loop, uh, but copy bag 203 for final water bottle and uh, waste system flush. Yes, uh, that's my bad. You're right now. I'm back on dragging the ground. Copy all, Mike. No worries. So, yeah, continuing to track inventory, as you mentioned, Tricia. Um, Thomas Marshburn, uh, we saw him earlier, but he's working on a tablet, and um, uh, we heard the communications back and forth that the team is going through each procedure and each step uh, and really just following the flight operations and docking operations uh, to make sure that uh, everything um, has been done and checked off before we can really get into the A-pass hatch opening and the Dragon hatch opening. Yeah, absolutely. And you heard earlier that we did dock about 45 minutes behind schedule, which meant that the rest of the crew schedule for the day was um, uh, pushed back by 45 minutes, or at least the next uh, two events on the crew schedule. So um, that also speaks to a big part of station life, and that crew time is extremely valuable and tracked very, very closely, sometimes even down to the second. Uh, this is to make sure that the crew is able to focus on things like scientific research research, uh, exercise, getting enough sleep, and just maximizing the efficiency of their days uh, on orbit. Although they do get, you know, downtime. Uh, like yeah. we mentioned, the uh, AX-1 crew is docking uh, and ingressing into the station during crew weekend for Expedition 67 crew. So, um, you know, there are there are times to have some fun. <laughs> so they can get to enjoy their time on space, do, do some flips and, yeah. uh, you know, uh, live in microgravity. Dragon, SpaceX on on dragging the ground or suit doffing. Go ahead, Jake. Hey, Mike. Uh, we're seeing indications that suit one has come undone from its umbilical. I want to confirm that the suit is dry or that uh, otherwise this was intended. It was intended, uh, mistakenly. It, we were just confused on the timing, so we're connecting that one again. The other three are still connected, and we're going for the one hour. Okay, Dragon, copy all. Sorry to play Big Brother, uh, and uh, as you were. So we are in a short handover period, but we should get views back of the International Space Station. Uh, but right before the video had cut off, we did see Thomas Marshburn open up the A-pass hatch, which is another significant milestone uh, in the um, docking procedure. So um, that is great news. I believe he was working on uh, removing the docking target, uh, which is affixed to the other side of the A-pass hatch. Um, that is what is used when Dragon was um, using his LiDAR to uh, dock with the space station. So that's gonna be removed and, and then the hatch will remain open and then we'll just wait on um, Dragon Hatch to open and the, the, the a, uh, AX-1 station crew. Houston station on the big loop, the A-pass hatch is open, no condensate in the vestibule.
Good news. Thanks for the report, Kayla. So yeah, things are continuing to go um, well. Uh, we'll wait for the Dragon Hatch to open up next. Um, it will be uh, a few moments from now. Yeah, you heard, uh, you know, several uh, back and forth between all the teams involved in coordinating this, uh, you know, it, and making sure that everyone's timeline and the order of steps that they're going in and the procedures that they're executing are, um, you know, everyone's in track with one another um, really highlights the importance of communication between all the teams. After the docking target comes off, uh, we will be affixing a hatch cover on the APAS hatch. As Kayla and Tom Marshburn continue to work um, in microgravity. And this is something that the AX crew, especially the folks um, that uh, haven't been to space before, are going to have to get used to. Kayla and um, uh, Tom here seem to be very fluid in their movements, uh, zipping around and, and you know uh, doing what they need to. But um, you know we've heard before from previous astronauts that it can be can take a little bit of time uh, to get used to movement and work in microgravity. So uh, we'll see um, you know how the AX crew. Uh, performs when they uh, eventually leave the Dragon and make their way to the ISS. Absolutely. And as they continue to make headway into hatch operations, we'll take it back to Dan Hewitt over at JSC for an update. Hey, thanks, Tricia and Andy. You guys nailed it. We got one of the hatches open, the APAS hatch. There's a couple of steps that uh, the crew has to go through now. The first is Andy said we're removing that docking target, so it's kind of a cross uh, mechanism that uh, is sticking out, and so obviously you want to you want to take that off, as otherwise that's going to impede your progress <laughs> through the hatch. Um, so they'll they'll remove that, get the hatch stowed, and then they uh, install a hatch cover just to provide a little bit extra padding on the hatch, just in case it gets bumped, protecting both the hatch hardware and the crew members. Um, then we're going to see them. Uh, move up uh, what's known as an IMV duct, an intramodular ventilation duct. Uh, if you can see that kind of large orange hose there, um, that is going to help uh, and eventually is going to get dragged into the Dragon spacecraft um, to actually integrate its atmosphere with the rest of stations. So that's where we're able to uh, provide essentially a positive flow integrating Dragon with the rest of the station stack. Um, so Dragon will be able to take advantage of station oxygen generation, carbon dioxide scrubbing, temperature control, everything. Uh, essentially just becoming almost another module uh, while it's docked to the space station. So they'll drag that ducting in, um, get it ready, and then we'll step into hatch equalization. And so this is uh, just making sure that the pressure uh, on either side of the Dragon hatch is equal, or as close to equal as possible. We can have a little bit of variance. Um, and once that's done, then it'll be time for the Dragon crew to open up the hatch on their side. So they'll uh, just stand by, they're able to monitor, uh, and actually they can see through a small window in the Dragon hatch um, and look at everything that uh, Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron are doing here inside the pressurized mating adapter. Um, so you can see them storing that stuff. We're going to get the cover um, over the uh, APAS hatch next. 
and then just get closer to that hatch opening. Again, we were about 45 minutes behind schedule for docking. Uh, we were expecting the hatch on Dragon uh, to be open just about 10 minutes ago. Um, so right now our timeline puts us at approximately 9.15 or so central. We could be moving that up uh, if the crews are able to get through the steps quickly uh, before we get that Dragon hatch open. And then after that's opened, uh, the AX-1 astronauts will be able to move through. They'll come down uh, through the the top hatch, the space-facing side of the Harmony module, make their way into Node 2, uh, where we'll then get everybody set up, the entire Expedition 67 crew, and all four of our AX-1 astronauts newly arrived and be able to execute a welcome ceremony. Um, there we can see Dragon Endeavor. It's docked uh, to that space-facing port on Node 2. We've got two docking adapters right now uh, that work for any U.S.-based vehicles that dock uh, as opposed to berthing to the space station like the previous version of Dragon. Um, and with this new arrival, we have two crewed versions, uh, two Dragons capable of carrying crew docked to the space station. We've got Endeavor uh, making a return to the space station, um, famously being uh, the first to fly astronauts, uh, Bob Enkin and Doug Hurley, to the station on uh, Demo 2, the, the first human space flight on the Dragon system. Uh, and then out of view, but essentially to the left of this camera view, uh, is the uh, Crew Dragon Endurance dock to the forward hatch of uh, the exact same module, Node 2. And that carried uh, NASA's SpaceX Crew 3 astronauts, uh, including Tom Marshburn and Caleb Barron, who we can see continue doing the hatch operations uh, to the space station last fall. So for right now, the crew continuing to step through the procedures. Uh, Tom Marshburn uh, almost done uh, with the hatch hops again. He's going to get the cover on, and then they're going to work to get that ducting uh, up to uh, get secured in the vestibule, uh, and then it can get mated after we get the hatch open uh, to help integrate the dragging cabin with the rest of the station atmosphere. And then the station crew will give a call down that uh, they're ready for hatch equalization, uh, as well as the Dragon crew uh, giving that same call down. And then we'll get a call up uh, from uh, the Capcom here in Houston, just telling the crew to stand by and giving a rough estimate on how long we expect that hatch equalization to take. And then once that's completed, we can get into the Dragon hatch open. And that, that the hatch gets opened on the Dragon side. It can be opened from either side by its design. Uh, but just following the normal procedures, it's going to be opened by the Dragon crew. Uh, and there's a decal actually on the hatch that just gives the instructions uh, for how to operate the hatch opening mechanism on board. And then after we get the Dragon hatch open, the crew will come on board and we'll get them all gathered together for a formal welcome ceremony on board the station. If you've ever watched a crew arrive, it's going to look very similar to that. This is something we do uh, with all of our new arrivals at the space station, uh, just to formally give them a welcome and uh, begin their stay on board. Once that's completed, though, they're going to get right to work with Tom Marshburn leading uh, the entire crew through uh, just an initial orientation that'll include all of the, the current residents of the station as well as the AX-1 astronauts as uh, so they just go through a safety briefing with him just walking through a reminder of where all the emergency hardware is, what their actions are uh, in the event of any kind of emergency, just going over um, paths, hatch operations, things of that nature, uh, as this is all stuff that gets trained on the ground, and then refreshers are always done right after new crew members arrive on orbit. Uh, and this is training that any individual flying to the space station goes through. Um, we've talked pretty extensively in the lead up to the flight um, over the 
the differences in training between uh, a traditional long duration astronaut and uh, one of the astronauts on the AX-1 mission, uh, one thing that is absolutely the exact same is that they receive emergency training, that, that safety training is that first and foremost uh, to have an effective response, every single member of the crew has to know what their job is in the event of an emergency. And so they'll just do that safety briefing. And then for Expedition 67, they'll largely get the rest of the day off. They have um, some cargo ops uh, on their timeline to uh, either unpack items that just flew up or just to assist the AX-1 crew uh, in offloading some of the cargo that they brought with them. Meanwhile, uh, Tom Marshburn will also uh, just spend a couple hours walking the newly arrived astronauts uh, just through an orientation, essentially. Uh, shows up on their timeline as something called crew handover, uh, just getting them acquainted with the surroundings, uh, walking them through the basics of um, where they'll be able to do uh, toiletry and hygiene uh, functions, where the galley is, where water dispensers are, things of that nature, um, just to get them reoriented uh, with where they're going to be living and working uh, for more than the next week. So all of that still to come for now though. Uh, we're still in these hatch operations um, waiting for additional confirmations. Uh, but right now it's Tom Marshburn continuing to work uh, on the station side. We did get confirmation that A-pass, so the station side hatch is open. Um, so he's removed a docking target, he's affixing a cover and then getting some of the inner module ventilation set up uh, before we then get ready for hatch equalization. Um, so we'll get a call from the crew on station, call from the crew on Dragon, and then a go from the ground and giving a rough approximation of how long we expect that to take. Um, but if we follow uh, the timeline as it was written out, uh, taking into account our roughly 45 minute uh, late docking time, we should be uh, within a half an hour of that Dragon hatch open. So we'll continue to follow along. We'll give you the updates as we hear them called out. Everything continuing on board the station to welcome AX-1 on board. is ready for Dragon Hatch equalization. So we just Copy heard that, and we'll stand another by step for completed. Endeavor's call for their half. So as mentioned, the station calling down first that they're ready for hatch equalization. Now we'll stand by for a call from the Crew Dragon Endeavor astronauts that they're ready for equalization. Uh, the, the ethos, the life support and environmental system officer here in Houston uh, reporting we should take only about two minutes for this hatch equalization to take place. Um, so we might be uh, hopefully jumping ahead on our timeline now. Station on the big loop. Uh, we are also ready for hatch equalization. Copy that, Endeavor. Dragon, SpaceX on Standby Dragon for Ground or Waste System Flash. Expected to take two minutes once we get started. Copy. Go ahead, Jake. 
Greg. Hey, Dragon. Uh, as you heard on the big loop, we are marching towards hatch open. Uh, last step there is hatch equalization, about two minutes for that. Um, we are tracking the waste system flush as the last big item to be completed in Dragon. We want to make sure it's on your agenda as well. Yes, Jake, good read. It is on our agenda. I thought it would be appropriate to skip that to get to the hatch open unless you think otherwise. Hey, Mike. Uh, glad we're talking about it. The hatch is going to mechanically block the waste system, and for that reason, it's required to do this flush uh, before hatch open. That's a great call. There's always a good reason for it. We'll put that in work right now. Thanks for working through that, Mike. All right, so both the station and Dragon crews have reported their readiness for hatch equalization uh, on board Dragon. They do have to do a flush of the waste disposal system first. And how's the uh, audio? Five, four, three, two, one. ceremony with the crew.
And continuing to get a view inside of Node 2, looking up at the space-facing hatch. That's where Crew Dragon Endeavor has docked. Tom Marshburn there. Uh, we just heard him do an audio check on the mic. We're going to see them use for that welcome ceremony. The station hatch is open. Uh, and we were just waiting for the crew on Dragon to do a final flush of that waste disposal system, after which we'll be able to step into hatch equalization. So that's just making sure pressures equalize, pressures essentially equal to each other uh, on either side of the Dragon hatch. And then the MCCX team at Hawthorne will give the Dragon crew a go to begin opening up that hatch. Um, we only expect that equalization to take about two minutes. Um, so it should happen pretty quickly. And then once that hatch is open, we'll be able to welcome the AX-1 astronauts on board. getting a pretty unique view here. This is that centerline camera that we were watching uh, during the final phases of Dragon's Approach. And as we are now docked, and it's right at, at the top hatch point, um, this is looking inside of the pressurized mating adapter, the PMA, um, where you can see NASA astronaut Kayla Barron there uh, just up and outside of the hatchway looking in. Um, so this was the camera feed that we were working to get routed over to the crew uh, during that final approach um, and still turned on at this point. Uh, but once the hatch, op hatch is opened, uh, we will lose this view. Um, but we are just still standing by for the Dragon hatch to get opened. Uh, we'll get into uh, hatch equalization momentarily. And as soon as we get into that, we expect it to only take about two minutes for the pressures to equalize. And then the Dragon crew will get the go to open up the hatch.
And this is Mission Control Houston just still waiting for that hatch open to take place. Uh, getting this really cool split screen view though, uh, as we're looking on the left at a camera inside of station node two, the Harmony module, and it's looking up at the space facing of the Zenith port where Crew Dragon's currently docked. And then on the right there, uh, the uh, centerline media camera uh, on the Dragon spacecraft looking inside of station. It's looking inside the uh, pressurized mating adapter number three, on top of which is international docking adapter number three, where uh, the Crew Dragon Endeavor docked successfully uh, just about an hour and a half ago with that docking at 729 Central. So again, we're just standing by for the hatch equalization to begin. We expect it to only take about two minutes, and that's just to ensure pressures are equal on uh, either sides of the Dragon hatch. Uh, so essentially in the Dragon cabin atmosphere uh, and in that vestibule and PMA area just on the other side, and the Dragon crew will get the go to open the hatch. There's a decal on the Dragon hatch, which can be opened from either side, uh, but it's gonna get opened on the Dragon side uh, following the nominal timeline. And then after we get the hatches open, there's a couple of immediate steps uh, just to configure Dragon um, for its long-term dock duration to the space station where it's gonna be uh, for more than a week uh, docked to that uh, upper part of uh, node two. Uh, there's a couple of steps they have to take to just uh, essentially prep uh, Dragon for that docked ops. They're gonna uh, safe or remove uh, some of the LIO cartridge, uh, the lithium hydroxide cartridge that's used to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere while Dragon's in free flight. Um, they just steal that up and store it temporarily, and then it gets reinstalled once Dragon's ready uh, to go out and uh, execute its free flight return. SpaceX Endeavour, Dragon to Ground. Dragon, SpaceX, ready to copy on Dragon to Ground. We are really ready for Dragon Hatch opening now with the uh, urine flush complete. And uh, would you like me to make that call in the big loop? Okay, copy all Dragon. We'll follow you into 4.400, section six. We've got one command to send, and then I'll uh, send a call on the big loop. Copy that. All right, and Dragon, now we are SpaceX ready for on Dragon to ground. One quick note, uh, wondering if we can come on board with cameras. That's affirmative, Jake. Come on board. Copy Dragon. We'll be on board imminently. And the camera is being turned on once again inside Dragon. We should be able to join them momentarily. Uh, but getting the go is we're now about to execute hatch equalization. We only expect that to take about two minutes. It'll be a command sent from the ground to the Dragon spacecraft from MCCX out in Hawthorne. 
Once that's complete, the crew will get the go to open up the hatch. SpaceX and ground also reporting 4.102, sorry, 1.2 is complete, 4.012. Copy all mic on suit doffing completion. And getting views inside of Endeavour once more, looking over uh, the shoulders of commander and pilot. Uh, you heard them report suits have been docked, so they're out of their flight suits, or they're out of their spacesuits, rather, uh, and those have been stowed away, now in flight suits and awaiting the hatch open operations. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground. We're standing by for final equalization. Uh, stand by for a call on the big loop. Okay, Jake, and just uh, to give you a heads up, we are now looking at 2.102, step 6.3. We suspect that that should say on MCCX go, but let us know if that's a mistake. So again, we're just standing by for that final hatch equalization. It'll be a command from MCCX in Hawthorne. That'll get sent up to Dragon, and they'll equalize pressures on either side of the hatch. Then the crew will get to go uh, on the Dragon side to open up the hatch and make their way inside the International Space Station. Dragon, SpaceX on Dragon to ground for 2.102 clarification. We see step 6.3 and confirm it is an MCCH go. Uh, that's after the hatch is open, uh, sort of a handover to the ISS uh, crew. Um, and uh, yeah. Okay, well one of you guys tells us to do it, we'll do it.
Dragon Station SpaceX on the big loop. Go for hatch opening per decal, followed by the remaining actions in 4.400, Section 6. Endeavor copies in work. All right, good news there. We're through hatch equalization. The crew's been given the go to open it up. And so there is a decal on the hatch itself. It shows them how to work the hatch mechanism. They're going to open it up, and it swings inside of the Dragon spacecraft to get stowed. Uh, after they get it open, they'll have a couple of steps um, just to configure Dragon for docked ops. They're going to uh, install a hatch seal cover just to protect that seal around the open hatchway. Um, as people are moving in and out. I'm also installing a cover uh, over the hatch itself. And now we're just standing by for hatch uh, open. The hatch is open. Copy that, hatch and open. There we go, hatch opening. The hatch opened. And the hatch opened at 9.13 a.m. Central Time. It's 14.13 GMT, 7.13 for the teams over in Hawthorne. So now they're going to install that hatch seal and a cover over the hatch itself and then start making their way on board the station. But the hatch is open. Nothing but space in between Crew Dragon Endeavor and the space station. And we're just standing by for the crew to start making their way through. Again, the hatch open on Dragon. So hatch open on the station side uh, some time ago. Hatch now open on Dragon. They've got a couple of steps just to prepare Dragon for docked. Uh, it's docked configuration. And then we should start to see them make their way through the pressurized mating adapter and into the International Space Station. So continuing to stand by, uh, we can see uh, the AX-1 astronaut still inside Dragon. And we should see them start making their way out momentarily. So 
Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn making his way down, and there we are. So Aton Sibby, first one through, followed shortly after by Mark Pathy making his way onto the space station. Looks like just behind him is going to be Larry Connor, the pilot for the AX-1 mission. Now through the hatchway into node two. Mark adjusting our camera angle for us. And then making his way out of a spacecraft named Endeavor onto the space station for the second time. Uh, no stranger to the orbiting lab, Mike Lopez Alegria. So with the entire AX-1 crew now on board, uh, we're going to spend a couple minutes just getting everybody set up, and then we'll be able to kick off our welcome ceremony. Copy that. We're taking a look. We'll let you know. So we can see the crew gathering here in No2 in the Harmony module. The Expedition 67 crew welcoming the AX-1 astronauts on board. Uh, there's still a couple of steps to get through. And then once we're 
uh, done with our initial configs on board, we'll be able to we'll be able to get into this welcome ceremony. So a short handover now with the, the video link. Uh, it's likely the crew will have a couple of tasks to take uh, before we get into that welcome ceremony, but good to see uh, them all making their way on board. Uh, as mentioned, there's a couple of, of post-docking configurations, uh, steps that have to take place on board Dragon, um, namely uh, sealing up a lithium hydroxide canister that's used to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere while Dragon's in free flight. Uh, also getting a hatch seal and a hatch cover on. So uh, it's looking like the crew might get the call to go through those steps. Uh, and then following that, we'll be able to uh, kick off our welcome ceremony. Uh, so Tom's going to do the grab sample, and I assume we assume we're talking about like the Lyo swap out uh, for the post hatch opening activity. Hey, copy. That's uh, in work, and we'll let you know when we're done. And so a couple of quick tasks for the crew uh, just before we get uh, into the welcome ceremony. Again, they got to go uh, seal that Lyo canister inside Dragon. They're going to take it out, uh, seal it up, and it's going to stay stowed until uh, they unseal it and reinstall it when Dragon's ready to depart the space station. Uh, also getting uh, that hatch seal on. Commander Tom Marshburn's also going to use a, a grab sample container just to get uh, an instantaneous air sample um, in the in that hatchway between the two, and that's just another standard procedure. Um, Houston and for Denver on the big loop. Uh, We're looking for a go from you in section uh, six, step one, six point two of two dot one oh two. And Endeavor Houston copies that. Apologies, make that 6.3. Yes, sir, for 6.3 we concur, but before we do that, we need confirmation from you that you have the IMV duct installation complete in step 6.1. We'll need to get back to you on that. Copy.
And so again, the crew uh, moved back up towards Dragon just to, to step through some of those post-docking uh, procedures. One of them is getting an IMV and intermodular ventilation duct installed. And that's just to, to begin circulating the cabin air from station through the cabin of the Dragon spacecraft as we continue to further integrate it into the station stack. Uh, they're also removing that LIO cartridge sealing up, sealing it up and then stowing it and then getting a hatch cover on the Dragon hatch and a uh, hatch seal cover around that seal um, just to give it some extra protection as folks are moving in and out of it over time. And then they'll make their way back into node two here and then we'll be able to officially and formally welcome the AX-1 crew on board. So that'll just take a couple of minutes uh, for all of that to get done. Again, just to put Dragon into its configuration for extended docked operations. Once we get through that, we'll get to our welcome ceremony, after which the uh, AX-1 crew will join the rest of Expedition 67 in a safety briefing, just doing a refresher of uh, what they trained on the ground going over all the different safety features of the International Space Station, uh, including exit paths uh, and also the location of emergency gear. And then the AX-1 astronauts have a, a couple okay, hours of handover have built in. For Copy that, Endeavor. Give us 30 seconds. We're going to activate the fan. Once that's done, I'll come back with a go for you in 6 decimal 3. Copy. All right, and so they have that, that IMV, that intermodular ventilation uh, now installed. And so the teams here on the ground in Houston are going to enable it. Um, from Mission Control Houston essentially turning the fan on, and that's just going to give uh, a positive pressure to start circulating atmosphere through the Dragon capsule with the rest of station. And then uh, per his procedures, uh, Mike L.A. is going to take a look and just make sure there's no debris uh, under a panel um, uh, on that uh, air circulation, and then he's going to move into uh, s removing the uh, lithium Station, hydroxide. Endeavor, Houston, uh, back with you on here. Uh, right. You are go to proceed in step six decimal three. And I want to relay also from the SpaceX team here, uh, if you guys can uh, circle back when that's done to uh, procedure four decimal 400 sec uh, section six. Sounds like you've got a couple small steps left to complete in that uh, procedure as well. All right, copy all, Scott. That's in work. We see one of our AX-1 crew members, Aton Stibby, uh, there in node two. We're gonna see the rest of them start to gather as they're just going through the final stages of getting Dragon configured for docked operations. We've successfully hooked up and turned on uh, the IMV fan, just integrating Dragon's cabin atmosphere with that of station. Right now, uh, the spacecraft commander, Mike L.A., 
uh, working to remove the lithium hydroxide canister, which is used to scrub CO2 from the atmosphere while Dragon's in free flight. That'll get sealed up and stored away, and then it'll get unsealed and reinstalled uh, when it's time for Dragon to undock and come home. They have several of these canisters on board to provide that critical life support function. And he's getting some assistance right now inside Dragon from uh, some of the Crew-3 astronauts who went through essentially the exact same procedures uh, when they docked the station in Crew Dragon Endurance. So very familiar with the procedures, giving him a hand to help uh, things get done as quickly as possible. They're also going to be installing a cover on the Dragon hatch uh, and also on the hatch seal, uh, just giving uh, both of those critical items some extra protection as folks are going to be moving in and out of Dragon uh, over the coming days. Uh, one of the AX-1 crew members is going to be sleeping inside Dragon during the dock stay. But again, once we get all these steps wrapped up, the rest of the crew is going to gather here in Node 2, the Harmony module, and then we'll be able to kick off our formal welcome to the first private astronaut mission ever to the International Space Station. And we're just continuing to stand by while the crew continues to configure endurance for its docked uh, operations on board the station. Dragon, SpaceX, it does appear that they've the successfully... Go ahead on the big loop, Jake. 
Hey Mike, uh, we saw you do some audio reconfiguration there. Uh, our ask is that you leave audio in the current configuration, uh, what you just did, push to talk to ISS. That's one. Uh, how copy? Copy that. Sounds good. Second item is that we're hoping you can step through 4.406.9 to disable backup lighting on the control panel. Yes, we will definitely do that. We're working through uh, 2.102 right now, which uh, has a higher priority for you. Copy you working through 2.102 as well. Uh, feel free to prioritize that. Uh, we have an eye on step 7.2 uh, in 2.102 and letting you know that you do have a go to perform the manual override on the AVV uh, panel. Okay, not required. All of the valves are in the closed position, and I also, if you didn't hear it, reported earlier that the Lyle cartridge is sealed and installed. Okay, copy, Mike. Uh, understand all valves indicate closed. No manual override needed. That's a good copy. All right, so continuing to tick off uh, some of the steps to get Dragon ready for docked ops, uh, we confirmed that the LIO, the lithium hydroxide canister, has been sealed and stowed. And then Spacecraft Commander Michael Lake confirming that all the Dragon vent valves are in the proper closed configuration. The only other items which we did see they were getting some assistance from NASA astronaut Kayla Barron is getting the hatch and the uh, hatch seal covers fully installed. And again, those just give some additional protection uh, to both the forward hatch and that hatch seal uh, during the docked operations as individuals are moving in and out of Dragon. Meanwhile, we see half of our AX-1 crew uh, standing by in Node 2, along with NASA astronaut and the current Expedition 67 Commander Tom Marshburn. And then once we're complete hey, with these final Houston, steps on board, Dragon, we'll see the, the rest loop. of the crew Wanted moving you know on board. That Dragon arrival configuration is complete for 2.102. Dragon SpaceX, we copy. Houston copies it well as well. Thank you. And so that completes all of their steps and their arrival through hatch opening procedures, meaning they've got the hatch and the hatch seal covers installed. All of their uh, tools have been stowed, and they're ready to start making their way out of Dragon and on into station. So we should see the rest of the crew come out of Dragon momentarily and then start gathering everybody inside of Node 2. We have 11 people on board the International Space Station right now.
Uh, on two, yeah, you got the grab sample. Let's stow to the stage bag. SpaceX Endeavor on the big loop. Uh, procedure 4.400 is complete. Dragon, SpaceX, we see the same. Great working with you, Mike. I think this is the last you'll hear from me today. And uh, next call, knock on wood, will be from Mike on the undock. Jake, great working with you, Kaylee, and the team. A uh, little bit of a delay, but that's been the story for AX1 so far. It's uh, all worth the wait. Thank you, guys. Station Houston on two. We are ready to do a quick scene check. If everyone wants to get in view, we'll do that, and then we can uh, get into the PAO event very soon. Just a heads up for you, we do expect a quick handover to happen at uh, 1450, uh, so just be aware of that during the event. All right, well, we now have Dragon in its dock configuration. No more calls. We got the uh, handover at 1450, and we will point. start gathering the forces here Handing under the scene. over now to the Capcom here in Houston. Thank the AX-1 crew join all of the astronauts on board the station. And now as we get everybody set up, we should be just moments away now, from kicking off our formal welcome ceremony for the first private astronaut mission to the space station. And the crew working to try and get our camera reoriented uh, so we can hopefully try and uh, get a view of all 11 people now living on board the space station. And guys, we like the scene. Looking good there. We should be able to get started here momentarily. Stand by.
And Tom, back with you real quick. I think you were trying to talk on the mic, but I think it might have been off. Could you uh, give another comm check real quick? Okay, comm check. Five, four, three, two, one. How do you copy? And we're hearing you. And Station, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Everybody loud and clear. Station is ready for the event. Kathy Leaders, this is Mission Control, Houston. Please call Station for a voice check. Hey, I think we already did that. I think, hey, I I think we already did that. I, I apologize. Think we, already did that. we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Tom, I don't know if you muted again. The microphone is, is on, and we uh, read you loud and clear, and we're ready to speak with you. Okay, well, I had an old boss whose his, uh, his greatest praise was when you heard some, him say, nicely done. Old? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, all I can say is uh, nicely done, and, and to the whole team, um, the SpaceX, Axiom, station team, and, uh, you know, Mike here, uh, I know that the, ex the Expedition 67 crew is very happy to see your crew. Um, I know Mike and I are very happy to see all of you there and, and seeing the new crew coming on board, um, looking so uh, healthy and happy to be there, and I'm Personally, very happy to see how, how good the Expedition 67 crew looks also. Raja, I didn't know you grew a mustache. So um, it's it's always it's always fun to see um, our crews there getting ready to go do a lot of work. I know the team has a lot of things lined up to do over this next week. And uh, this is going to be important for us to be able to work as a team for our Expedition 67 folks to get the important work that they need to get done. But then Mike, obviously your team to be able to get their work done too. So we're looking forward to see all the exciting things that are going to be going on and, uh, and then seeing everybody make it safely home. And just a short momentary handover, we'll get that communication back real quickly with the space station and then continue through our welcome. So, Mike, do you have a few words? And Houston, I believe we're back with you. Hey, Tom, this is uh, this is stuff. Can you guys hear us? It's good to hear you, stuff. We can read you loud and clear. Great. Well, first, um, let me let me thank you and uh, Expedition sixty seven crew for uh, welcoming our crew on board. Um, we're very excited to uh, to be there, of course. Uh, Mike, Larry, Aton, Mark, you guys look great. Uh, the the uh, dragon ride looks like uh, 
uh, that sat with you well. Uh, so um, first, I'll say uh, thanks to our to our SpaceX team for getting you there. Uh, we that was really awesome. Uh, my thanks to NASA for uh, for hosting us and to the entire crew. You know, we've been talking about this uh, history making mission for a long time. So we're going to stop talking about it now and just get on with it. So uh, you guys have a great, uh, a great mission. We we'll look forward to it. And uh, and with that, I'll hand it over to uh, L.A. to uh, do the pinning ceremony. Hey, Mike and Kathy. Uh Thanks for greeting us on board. I got to tell you, this is, it's quite an experience. Um, I, I can't even begin to describe how fun it's been to be in Dragon for the last day and a half or so, watching um, these guys' faces light up. True story. You know, we had just reached uh, orbit and getting out of our suits, and I was, you know, busy at uh, doing commander stuff, and one by one, I could hear them say, expletive deleted as soon as they looked out the window literally every single one of them and i just smiled a little bit and then when i got my turn to look at it same expletive it's just an amazing experience anyway um you know there's a tradition that when you cross a certain boundary and that boundary is debatable but in the united states it's 50 miles uh you become an astronaut in altitude and uh, that happened to these three gentlemen for the first time yesterday. Um, it was a pretty exciting moment. We were in the middle of first stage, but we noted it. And now I'd like to note it a little more officially. Um, there is a very special pin that NASA astronauts wear that is gold and designed by the original Mercury 7. But um, until recently, there has been no internationally recognized pin. So. None of the other five, or I should say other four space agencies, nor do the Chinese that I know of have a symbol that people wear in civilian clothes for, um, for commemorating that they're astronauts. So a little while ago, the Association of Space Explorers, which encompasses a lot of members from 38 different countries of flown astronauts, uh, decided to commission such a pin. And I happen to have three of them in my hand. Tom, would you break them out for me? And uh, when I pin these on, I think the numbers will be 582, 583, and 584, respectively, for uh, Larry, Aton, and Mark. I hope they will wear these with the pride that they deserve. And then I'm going to let Larry say something while I pin his, et cetera. Yeah, well, first off, uh, probably words don't describe it. I mean, I'm thrilled and honored to be up here. Thanks to SpaceX, phenomenal ride. I mean, no pun intended, but out of this world. Thanks to uh, Axiom for making this uh, dream come true. Thanks to NASA. Thanks to all the crew. Unbelievably uh, welcome. And yeah, we're here to experience this. But we understand there's a responsibility, and the responsibility is for this first civilian crew to get it right. And that's what we're fully committed to with the support of everybody here at the ISS and, uh, and on the ground. So it's going to be a busy week of research for us, and uh, I'm sure it's going to fly by. And now I'd like to turn it over to my friend, Aton. I'll take the opportunity. I need to press something. I'll take a slide. To say a few words in Hebrew on the International Space Station. ברוכים הבאים לתחנת החלל הבינלאומית, פעם ראשונה שאפשר לדבר פה בעברית. זכינו להיות חלק מצוות של 11 שנקרא Expedition 67. זה, זה קבוצת עבודה שתעבוד ביחד, כולנו ביחד נעזור אחד לשני להשיג את המטרות, כל אחד בא עם תוכנית עבודה מלאה, ובהצלחה לכולם, בהצלחה לרקיע. מרק. תודה, איתן. קודם כל, אני רוצה להודות לחברי ה-ISS על ההזדמנות הטובה. זה היה מאוד 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 מאוד
making your way to us and then to come on board and, and be so, uh, so warmly greeted by all of you. That was great. Thanks a lot. And looking forward to spending the next uh, few days. Sorry, I, I got to forget to, to look, look up there. Um, next few days here with all of you. And uh, wow, it's just amazing to be here. Um, it's, it's hard to find, find the words, but uh, it's been an amazing journey. And I don't, I'm not just talking about the last 24 hours. I'm talking about uh, everything that's got us here. It's, it's, been, it's been amazing. And thanks to, to uh, Mike and all the folks at Axiom uh, for, uh, for hatching this plan and, and getting it going, and, and to SpaceX and NASA for, uh, for making it happen as well. Thanks, everyone. And, and, and sorry, last but definitely not least, uh, all my family and friends who, uh, whose love and support made this possible. And we just want to say the uh, Expedition 67 crew, all of us are incredibly thrilled and excited to welcome Axiom on board. And uh, on this historic uh, day for uh, continued, we expect long-term uh, cooperation with uh, NASA, with our international partners, and with private companies and private astronauts. So we are ready to go to work. Thank you. Godspeed, everybody. Thank you, guys. Have fun. Okay, with that, AX-1 officially welcomed on board the International Space Station. So it was a very successful day. We got a little bit of uh, extra time there as we hung out about 20 meters from the space station, but everything completing as expected. Uh, we were able to dock AX-1 to the space station at 7.29 a.m. Central. It's 12.29 GMT. Well, they were flying just about 258 statute miles over the Atlantic, getting the hatches open a little less than two hours later, and four crew members, the first ever all-private astronaut mission to the space station, now on board and welcome. So it's going to be an extremely busy week for them ahead, but it was great to take everybody through the operation so far this morning. That's going to do it for me from Mission Control Houston. So I'll sign off and send it back to Andy and Tricia at Hawthorne. Thank you both for being with me this morning, and congratulations again on the successful docking of AX-1 to the station. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, congratulations to yourself, too. It's been a super exciting 24 hours. Uh, but that is going to wrap it up for us here uh, in Hawthorne, too, uh, for the live joint coverage of AX-1's arrival to the International Space Station. It has been an honor to support AX-1. Uh, we wish the Axiom crew a successful time on station, and we look forward to joining you when it's time to return home. Yes, it was certainly very exciting to see the camaraderie already building, and we're looking forward to what they'll accomplish in the next eight days. Starting Monday, April 11th, we will be providing daily updates from Axiom Mission Control to highlight the range of science research and STEAM events the crew will be conducting over their eight-day mission. Be sure to visit axiomspace.com and follow the Axiom social media channels for real-time updates. On behalf of SpaceX, Axiom Space, and NASA, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll see you next time.